Oh yeah. We're up all night to get spooky. <laughs> oh, there's a fancy fireplace. So here we are. Here we are. Well, here we are again. It's always such a pleasure. Remember when you tried to kill me twice? Bum bum ba dum bum. I swear I heard that song once, and I can't remember where it was. It's that was the Warrior. ending. It's the ending from Portal Two. Ah uh, yes. Because "Still Alive" was such a popular song, they're just like, "Well, we gotta do it for the sequel." Always gotta keep trendy. Have you ever heard Jonathan Colton's cover of Baby Got Back? It's kind of amazing. Yes, I have heard that. <laughs> oh, I love this scene. Rick, where do you find these? YouTube. Now you you know, like, that's my living room. It's a live shot. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> I'm sorry, I want to live in this. Dancing. I want to live in this video. I do too. Golly G Willikers. Not quite enough books on those shelves though. They look a little barren. I could probably fill them up. I'll just replace the library with video games, eh? My personal old library of technology. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> I would cover probably half those shelves with like Rubik's Cube type puzzles. <laughs> God. You opened the box. We came. There is there is a Lemeshan uh, Rubik's Cube. Sure. I know. I've seen it. You know. <laughs> you think I wouldn't have looked for that? So <laughs> <laughs> sad they took out uh, Hell uh, Hellraiser's voice in Dead by Daylight. I was like, you guys. Wait, they took like, his voice out? Yeah, because the fans wouldn't stop making uh, ru uh, well, you know, jokes about. We opened the box, we came, and they, you know, uh, that's what gamers do with jokes like that these days. They have to make it, oh. Uh, they, they run them into the ground until they're not funny anymore. Yes. Yeah. Ah, uh, so of course they yeah. had to, and of course they make them lewd. That's the other thing too. Mm. Me and Stoker would never do that. We don't, we don't like lewd stuff. Oh, hey. Mm. Apparently creepypasta.com does let you sort by length. Oh! 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 Okay. Um. Let me do well, that. Then. I'll be. You do like a level two for short stories, five hundred and two thousand two hundred fifty words. Have I never noticed this? Okay. Level two. That works. Give me that pasta. Let's start by. Give me that pasta. Give me that pasta. Give me that pasta. Give me that pasta. Okay. Um. I'm at the top of the shelf today, so... You ready? Let's do it, you see. Okay. Bring the spooky. Do. I'll bring the spooky. The Canadian spooky. The goose spooky. Let's go. Alright. So submit for your approval tonight, everybody, for the Night Society. The Canada Geese of Lake Pleasant. Oh, Written that sounds like a real horror. I know geese. <laughs> Written by A.S. Lowell. I'm a researcher studying Canada geese for the last 10 years. I never published my research. Specifically, my small team and I study a small population of Canada geese that migrates to Arizona during the winter months from Alaska. This work mostly involves checking the new adults tagged during the summer months from our sister team in Alaska. This is important because the specific flock we are keeping track of has two unusual things that our teams determined require further study. The first is the unusual size of the flock itself. The average size of a migrating flock of Canada geese usually falls in the range between 30 and 60 individuals. The population was originally counted as 239 individuals in 2009. And as the last count in 2018, it's grown to 367 individuals. It was first discovered in 2009 by a fisherman at Lake Pleasant when he noticed the large flock come in and land in late November when the busy summer lake is empty of weekend water sports enthusiasts. This initial research only consisted of the initial counting of the population fitting track bracelets on a couple of individuals. Come April, the flock left the area of the lake as expected and started their migration to Alaska. This led to the discovery of the second thing that are making this flock so unusual in its behavior. It's normal for a population of geese to not be not begin migrating all at once, usually leaving a smaller groups like described earlier. This population, however, left as a single group on the same day and 
near as we could tell the same hour. The radio tracking bracelets fitted to the individuals also showed a strange behavior of the flight pattern. I'm sure most everyone here is familiar with the normal V shape that Canadian geese fly in while traveling. Without going into much detail, it's the most optimal pattern that the flock can fly in in order to conserve energy for a long trip to the breeding grounds during the spring and summer months. We honestly thought it was a mistake when the first reading of the GPS tracking bracelet came and showed us that our flock wasn't flying in this V formation. Because of the few amount of GPS units our team could afford at the time, it was impossible to tell what the formation was, but the this was, but the distribution of tracked individuals showed definitely that the flock could not be flying in the V pattern normal for Canadian geese. With the unusual size of the flock and their initial findings of the flight pattern, it wasn't hard to secure fundings for more GPS units to attach the next time the flock appeared at the lake. It also allowed us to get in contact with the closest ornithology professor in Alaska in order to get an accurate account of their breeding grounds. Unfortunately, the breeding ground, uh, the breeding area of this flock was in a pretty remote area so that professor and his students could only get to their breeding grounds for a day or two in the middle of June, but all of the goslings had already hatched or their nesting behavior wouldn't be studied that first year. However, they were able to accomplish this important task of attaching your GPS to the breeding adults in order to try and get more accurate representatives of their flight patterns. They also gave us an accurate number of individuals in the population. And as expected, the GPS genomes transmitted the first migration data in the middle of October. We were expecting some exciting results as well. With the inclusion of the new units, we would get to get more accurate pictures of what their unusual flight pattern actually was. The flock left Alaska in a single hour and formed into the first noticeable pattern three hours afterwards. The pattern wasn't very clear despite the number of GPS units attached, but this could be a tribute to the unusual size of the flock. It was actually one of the research students working in my team that put the dots together, quite literally, as our readout of the flight pattern was only a number of dots representing each individual unit on um, it. The student, who I won't name for anatomy, sent me the readout when the flock was somewhere in British Columbia, while missing obvious spots in it was possible to make out a single word. Butcher. Yes, you read that correctly. The geese were flying a formation that spelled out the word butcher. Like I imagine most of you doing right now, I dismissed the image. It was hard to be an error in a GPS unit sort of student who was reading too much into it and connected dots that weren't there. The geese landed at Lake Pleasant in early November, and by sheer chance, the same fisherman that had seen them at the first time was out fishing again when they approached the lake and informed us of their arrival again. I remember the email from him because he emphasized how freaked out he was when he first saw them in the distance. Freaked out because he clearly saw that the flock was flying in a pattern that spelled his last name, Butcher. Coincidence. That was the only thing that made sense to think at the time. Or maybe my student had been playing a joke on me with the GPS tracking image, and the fisherman was involved? I stopped thinking about that when I saw an image of the fisherman's face on the local news two weeks later with his full name, Jonathan Butcher, plastered on my TV screen. According to the news anchor, he had been murdered by his wife when he was caught watching porn. A senseless and sad way to go, but I still refuse to believe it was anything more than coincidence. The next couple of months we was filled with multiple trips to Lake Pleasant, attaching more GPS units we managed to escape together, and getting another count of the population for our records. The flock left in April as a single unit just like last year, but of all, we weren't able to get a visual on what our final pattern looked like until the first GPS unit came in in a couple of hours later. This time, the word they were spelling was much clearer as the new GPS units failed many of the gaps we have seen in the previous readings. Shilling. This was when I finally started to believe that something strange was going on. As I have gotten these readings myself, it wouldn't have been impossible for my team to change or mess with them. The word itself didn't mean anything to me besides being the name of a former pitcher from Arizona's MLB team. In May 2010, Wendy Schilling of Archer Rage, Alaska, was shot and killed by her husband when he arrived home early from his long haul truck route to find her in bed with his brother. This happened two and a half weeks after our Canadian geese flock landed at the breeding grounds. Because of this particular interest, I was talking, I was taken with this flock. I asked my colleagues to check on the flock in the breeding grounds and not know anything in particular or be, uh, weird behavior with the flock shown there. Bless his heart, he spent an entire week at the breeding grounds by himself, taking into account and attached even more GPS units to them, and unfortunately, the week we didn't yield any unusual behavior from the flock. 
and hence didn't give any answers as to what the hell was going on. Come October of 2010, the flock flies out of their home in Alaska and towards their summer home here in Arizona. Considering what happened the last two times, I waited impatiently with the first GPS reading came in. Townsend. A week and a half later, after landing at Lake Pleasant, Jacqueline Townsend was killed in a road accident when her husband drove drunk from the bar in Norfolk, Phoenix. The husband survived the accident and was charged with manslaughter. In April 2011, the flock left Lake Pleasant and arrived in Alaska, keeping a formation spelling out the name Richardson. In June 2011, Tim Richardson disappeared in the Alaskan wilderness when his partner and him went camping just outside Anchorage. While the partner was eventually recovered, Tim was never found he'd be declared dead. Annie Nowak, murdered by her abusive husband in Phoenix in December 2011, two weeks after her geese landed at Lake Pleasant. Brandon Zamora. Mayev Gagudry. Emmanuel Chambers. Every single one dead at the fault of the person who loves them the most in the world. Every single one dead within three weeks of our geese landing within 100 miles of them. Every single one named weeks beforehand. Because I don't want to sound like a crazy person get all my fundings cut off from my research, I never pu published the results of this research. However, I feel the need to mention this because the geese left their winter home at Lake Pleasant yesterday. Just like all of our GPS readings over the last decades, the formation of birds spelled out the name. I'm currently on a working vacation with my wife in Anchorage to try and see this group of geese coming in for myself. So I was excited to look at the first glance of uh, reading from the flock yesterday. I became a lot less excited when I saw the name that they spelled out. Stevenson. My name is Dr. Aaron Stevenson. Our old credits. <laughs> Geese are creepy. Geese are creepy mm -hmm. without like creepy posture. They're just inherently creepy. Like, yeah, it was, that's why I said at the beginning, I'm like, geese are already a horror story. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you look them up close, and they're like, fucking, they, they've got the, that dinosaur gaze, like, I'm gonna murder you. Like, Don't some of them have, like, teeth, too? Oh, yeah? Yeah, I was, uh, yeah. yeah, they yeah. have teeth. I got bit by Canadian the edge of their <laughs> what, was, uh, what was the name of that story again? Name and author? Uh, let me get it again. It was uh, The Canadian Geese of Lake Pleasant by A.S. Lowell. Canadian geese. Or the Canada geese of Lake Pleasant, sorry. Can you just link it in the chat? Or, sure. Yeah, in in our chat or their chat, either chat. Oh, sure. If I read chat chat. I put it in our chat. Here we go. So, I believe it's my turn. So, submitted for the approval of the Midnight Society, this is The Custom of the Alabama Watermelon Man, written by Blake Blizzard, found on creepypasta.com. He was a striking gentleman. I mean the stereotypical southern, yes sir, no sir, mother may I, gentleman. The first time I met him, I saw this stranger from a distance attempting to move a heavy-looking recliner into the condo next to mine. My wife and I hadn't had next door neighbors for over two years. I was met with mixed emotions as I'm happy someone finally moved in, it's a great neighborhood after all, but I also enjoy the quiet. Our particular setup is a 1950s era black ta brick, brick townhouse con condominium where every complex holds about 10 individual homes. We are awfully close together and the walls are pretty thin. I was just coming back from ordering a pizza and was excited about consuming said pizza. As it made it closer to the eventual destruction of dough sauce and cheese, I saw this man struggling with the aforementioned recliner. I mean, he was so underwater it was kind of embarrassing. We all know how awkward some things are to physically move. Recliners can be so much worse due to the internal steel mechanism inside that makes them recline. It looked like this dude was so unprepared for this task that I had to stop and help. We made eye contact, the man looking drained. He was smaller, about 5'6", maybe 150 pounds in a hurricane had deep blue eyes, bald, and ha had a genuine niceness to him that hit me like sunlight. I instantly needed to help him even more. Hey man, looks like you need a hand. Let me throw this pizza inside and I'll be right out. He just smiled, nodded, and stood up, had it, leaving his awful deadlift-like crouch. It looked like he was going to give that chair one more spine-snapping attempt. Between the two of us, we moved the chair easily into his living room. 
He thanked me profusely and we introduced ourselves. His name was Vin, and he was from Alabama. Quite a few states away as I live here in Michigan. He explained that he buys and rents out condos around the U.S. Vin then gave me his business card where I saw he was in fact based out of Orange City, Alabama. One week later, I heard a knocking on my front door. As I entered the door, I saw... As I, as I answered the door, sorry. As I entered the door, I saw a wide, smiling Vin holding a pretty good-sized, healthy-looking watermelon. He was thankful for the hand in moving his recliner and decided to offer me a giant piece of fruit for my trouble. I thanked him, actually tickled by the gesture. Honestly, I placed it on the counter and never touched it. Not because I don't like watermelon, I just never got around to eating it. I didn't find out until much later that I encountered one of the most brutal serial killers in U.S. history. Two weeks later, as I was coming home from work, I was again greeted by Vin holding a big slice of another watermelon. Hope you enjoyed the watermelon. Thought I'd get you another one. Uh, thanks, I said. My wife and I loved the first one. I lied, of course, but I didn't want to be rude. He was just so nice and genuine I couldn't tell him we threw the first one out. I thought it was kind of strange to offer a watermelon to someone you just met, but figured it was some kind of southern thing. I even googled if that was true. All I found was that it was a typical Japanese gesture of kindness. Striking it off, I still appreciated the gesture. I actually had a few bites of this one to be nice. It was okay, I'm not a huge fan of the taste to begin with. And that was the last time I saw my neighbor Vin. Over the years, I'd see different people come and go from the next door condo. I assumed Vin was renting it out, and that was that. One day, while browsing the news on my phone, I saw an interesting story title. One strange thing has been found around five apparent homicide victims over the last two years. A watermelon. My body started to tingle. Either this was a gigantic coincidence, or I had met the Alabama watermelon man. That wasn't what the press was calling him, that's just the first thing I thought of when I read this story. Obviously, they couldn't know he was from Alabama. There, apparently, there had been five men all throughout the country stabbed and beaten to death with a giant green watermelon placed near their lifeless body. There had been two mid-twenties aged men found within a few miles of each other um, in a condo complex in Indiana. One older man in his forties had been found crushed beyond recognition in the Tampa Bay, Florida area. One man was found in the western part of Michigan, beaten so badly he was unrecognizable. He also had one of his arms sawn completely off. And the last victim was actually all the way in Alaska. How in the hell did they even connect these, I thought. Reading deeper into the article, I found that the local police made it public early on that an untouched fresh watermelon was placed at the scene of the two Indiana men, probably trying to get any help from the public they could, thinking it was a local person who may have, may have been seen buying watermelons, I guess. When the next couple of gruesome murders were found, one of the Tampa detectives remembered that story from Indiana, and from then on, the country's police forces were waiting for this watermelon killer. Shutting down my phone, I sat in silence for hours, days maybe. Now what? Do I wait to get brutally dismembered? Did the Alabama watermelon gentlemen give their victims the fruit and then wait to kill? Should I contact the police or the FBI? Would I sound like a lunatic? I'd say it had been years since I'd seen Vin. I know this could all be a huge coincidence and maybe I'm just paranoid as hell, but my gut feeling was that something very bad was about to happen. He had killed all men, so I felt fairly sure that my wife was not in danger, so that was a relief. Should I start arming myself like Arnold in Commando? A light bulb shattered over my head, figuratively of course, and I ran to loot the drawer where we kept random paperwork, including business cards. I found it. Vin from Orange City Condos in Alabama. I looked up the Condo Association info on that card to find that indeed it was a real place, and his name was on the website, although not as Vin. It's another name that started with V that I will not disclose. The internet is an amazing place. You can do a little detective work and find anything. I linked Vin to several properties throughout the states, including ones in Indiana, Alabama, my home state of Michigan, of course, and even the last frontier, Alaska. Needless to say, that my internet sleuthing did not help calm my mind. Still a massive coincidence. I peeked through my windows almost every day before I left my house. I had lights on and camera put in. I almost threw up when I saw watermelons at the grocery store. This went on for a calendar year until the memory of Vin, the Alabama gentleman, the possible watermelon killer, disappeared. I've always been into true crime, serial killer lore, and interesting lesser known stories like the smiley face killers and the toy box killer. These kinds of subjects don't get their own coverage on Netflix or national television. I found them on YouTube from content creators like Rainbot, Nexpo, and Nick Crowley. It was on one of these channels I found an amazing, albeit terrifying, recounting of the custom of the Alabama Watermelon Man video. I probably looked like that character from A Clockwork Orange when he's being forced to watch hours of videos with his eyes pried open. I've watched over one million hours of ser serial killer videos, but not one of those videos w were about anything I could possibly be involved in. The narrator went into detail of killing the social media posting around the event, and even some real, somewhat censored pictures of the actual crime scenes. 
The only thing I can remember from this video was that the watermelon was fresh. It wasn't rotten or fake. I'd gotten two fresh watermelons from the Alabama man. Why was I alive? I thought about DMing the YouTuber that created this video. They had a great grasp of the story. But I felt like maybe that would be a bad idea overall. Hi. I might have run into the watermelon killer, smiley face. That would be a freaking dumb addition to the comment section. I did leave a comment, though. I just left a single emoji. Imagine Macaulay Culkin doing his most famous scene ever to make it simple. I guess that was all took. Several days after watching and commenting on the watermelon killer video, I opened my door to see a card on the steps. My wife and I left cards for each other frequently, so I was not at first alarmed. Seeing a cartoon of a watermelon on the envelope, I became alarmed. I shakily opened the note with blood absolutely rocketing through my body. You're one in a melon, it said on the inside, with a sketch of a watermelon slice that had a little smiley face. Soon after, there was nationwide breaking news. The man that struggled to move a reclining chair ten feet from his front lawn to his front door that I met years ago had been taken into custody in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. The man I knew as Vin had committed one more deplorable crime taking the life of a 30-something nomad outside a nightclub in the beach resort town. Smashed watermelon was found all over the corpse. I followed the now-dubbed Alabama Watermelon Man story from start to finish. I had a Google alert place so that every time his name came up I would be notified. When he asked why he chose watermelons to mark his crimes, his response was just, I just lack watermelon. Fifteen years later, the man I knew as Vin was leaving death row to face the chair. I suppose you could describe it as more of an examination table, as electric chairs are not really used anymore. Before the deadly lethal injection cocktail was administered, he was asked if he had any last words, and he said, Be nice to people. Well, you can tell he's southern because of how overly polite he is. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Forgive my horrible southern accent. No, I will never forgive it. <laughs> Maybe Miller should have read that one. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he could have been you about just got water. Or Miller, their country drawl. Look, I know. when your when your mother loves country music and you listen to it all the time during your first ten years of life, you pick up on that country accent. <laughs> nice bucket nice. jackets. Yes, sir. So right. I believe. It's up. It's on you, Miller. <laughs> yeah, I found a couple. Cool. Um, this one is a little less of a normal narrative. Uh, this is a sort of storytelling from somebody on a Reddit post. Uh, for the approval of the Midnight Society, I would like to read for you. I'm a search and rescue officer of the U.S. Forest Service, and I have some stories to tell. Uh, I've been an SAR officer for a few years now, and along the way I've seen some things that I think you guys will be interested in. I have a pretty good track record for finding missing people. Most of the time they just wander off the path or slip down a small cliff, they can't find their way back. The majority of them have heard the old, stay where you are thing, and they don't wander far. But I've had two cases where that didn't happen. Both bother me a lot and I use them as motivation to search even harder on the missing persons cases I get called on. The first was a little boy who was out berry picking with his parents. He and his sister were together and both of them went missing around the same time. The parents lost sight of them for a few seconds and in that time both the kids apparently wandered off. When their parents couldn't find them, they called us and we came out to search the area. We found the daughter pretty quickly and when we asked where her brother was, she told us that he'd been taken away by the bear man. She said he gave her berries and told her to stay quiet, and he wanted to play with her brother for a while. The last she saw of her brother, he was riding on the shoulders of the bear man and seemed calm. Of course, our first thought was abduction, but we never found a trace of another human being in that area. The little girl was also insistent that he wasn't a normal man, that he was tall, covered in hair like a bear, and he had a weird face. We searched that area for weeks, and it was one of the longest calls I've ever been on, but we never found a single trace of that kid. The other was a young woman who was out hiking with her mom and grandpa. According to the mother, her daughter had climbed up a tree to get a better view of the forest, and she never come back down. 
They waited at the base of the tree for hours, calling her name, before they called for help. Again, we searched everywhere, and we never found a trace of her. I have no idea where she could have possibly gone, because neither her mother or grandpa saw her come down. A few times, I've been out on my own searching with a canine, and they've tried to lead me straight up cliffs. Not hills. Not even rock faces. Straight, sheer cliffs with no possible handholds. It's always baffling, and in those cases, we usually find the person on the other side of the cliff, or miles away from where the canine has led us. I'm sure there's an explanation, but it's sort of strange. One particularly sad case involved the recovery of a body. A nine-year-old girl fell down an embankment and got impaled on a dead tree at the base. It was a complete freak ass accident, but I'll never forget the sound her mother made when we told her what had happened. She saw the body bag being loaded into the ambulance and she let out the most haunting, heartbroken wail I've ever heard. It was like her whole life was crashing down around her, and a part of her had died with her daughter. I heard from another SAR officer that she killed herself a few weeks after it happened. She couldn't live with the loss of her daughter. I was teamed up with another SAR officer because we'd received reports of bears in the area. We were looking for a guy who hadn't come home from a climbing trip when he was supposed to, and we ended up having to do some serious climbing to get to where we figured he'd be. We found him trapped in a small crevasse with a broken leg. It was not pleasant. He'd been there for almost two days, and his leg was very obviously infected. We were able to get him into a chopper, and I heard from one of the EMTs that the guy was absolutely inconsolable. He kept talking about how he'd been doing fine, and when he got into the top, a man had been there. He said the guy had no climbing equipment, and he was wearing a parka and ski pants. He walked up to the guy, but when the guy turned around, he said he had no face. He was just blank. He freaked out and ended up trying to get off the mountain too fast, which is why he'd fallen. He said he could hear the guy all night, climbing down the mountain and letting out these horrible muffled screams. That story bothered the hell out of me. I'm glad I wasn't there to hear it. One of the scariest things I've ever had happen to me involved a search for a young woman who'd gotten separated from her hiking group. We were out until late at night because the dogs had picked up her scent. When we found her, she was curled up under a large rotted log. She was missing her shoes and pack, and she was clearly in shock. She didn't have any injuries, and we were able to get her to walk with us back to base ops. Along the way, she kept looking behind us and asking us why that big man with black eyes was following us. We couldn't see anyone, so we just wrote it off as some weird symptom of shock. But the closer we got to base, the more agitated this woman got. She kept asking me to tell him to stop making faces at her. At one point she stopped and turned around and started yelling into the forest, saying that she wanted him to leave her alone. She wasn't going to go with him, she said. She wouldn't give us to him. We finally got her to keep moving, but we started hearing these weird noises coming from all around us. It was almost like coughing, but more rhythmic and deeper. It was almost insect-like. I don't really know how else to describe it. When we were within sight of base ops, the woman turns to me, and her eyes are about as wide as you can imagine a human could open them. She touches my shoulder and says, he says to tell you to speed up. He doesn't like looking at the scar on your neck. I have a very small scar on the base of my neck, but it's mostly hidden under my collar, and I have no idea how this woman saw it. Right after she says it, I hear that weird coughing right in my ear, and I just about jumped out of my skin. I hustled her to ops, not w trying not to show how freaked out I was, but I have to say I was really happy when we left the area that night. This is the last one on Sal, and it's probably the weirdest story I have. Now I don't know if this is true in every SAR unit, but in mine it's sort of an unspoken regular thing we run into. You could try asking it about it with other SAR officers, but even if they know what you're talking about, they probably won't say anything about it. We've been told not to talk about it by our superiors. At this point, we've all gotten so used to it that it doesn't even seem weird anymore. On just about every case, we were really far into the wilderness, I'm talking 30 or 40 miles. At some point, we'll find a staircase in the middle of the woods. It's almost like if you took the stairs in your house, cut them out, and put them in the forest. I asked about it the first time I saw some, and the other officer just told me not to worry about it, that it was normal. Everyone I asked said the same thing. I wanted to go check them out, but I was told very emphatically that I should never go near any of them. 
I just sort of ignore them now when I run into them because it happens so frequently. And those are my SAR stories. So that's where I left my stairs. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it was Jonas the whole time. The whole, the whole time. Hugging me for ages. I would have gotten away with it too. If I hadn't been for you, you, you meddling little kids and your, your mangy kangaroo. Anyway. I see stairs just in the middle of the forest somewhere on like one of the SCP articles. <laughs> Probably. I mean, either that, the the SCP article probably inspired that, or this inspired the SCP article. It's tough to say. Or it might be a real, actual thing SAR officers wrote, run into, and two different people wrote about it. <laughs> you know what? That's fair. That's fair. That's valid. Have you tried the salad? <laughs> the bear man. Yeah, Ty. It, yeah, the the story spells a B E A R, so I guess it's yeah, yeah. We're not kind of Sam Sam Squatch. Yeah, we're not talking about uh, the local nudist. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And speaking of the local nudist, I think it's Rick's turn. Oh boy, uh, I can't remember <laughs> if I we actually read this story last Come year. Come on, sucker! Don't throw stones from glass houses. Because this one sounds familiar, <laughs> but I don't know if it was because it was read last year or because I've actually read it before. I just post that in the. Oh, uh, let's see. It's quick. Uh, I don't remember that. I don't remember this one either. Either. Yeah. I okay. Think you're, uh, you're good to go. Uh, I must have read it before. Okay. Uh, submitted for the approval of the Midnight Society. Rabbits in the Creek. I'm writing this because my family won't talk about it anymore. I'm the only one who can't seem to forget. I was raised on the outskirts of Preston, a small town in southern Idaho with a population of around 5,000. My more immediate community was an isolated, dead-end dirt road called Bear Creek. Less than 20 families lived on the Bear Creek. I didn't mind being so isolated. I grew up in the comfort of wide fields and close neighbors that only rural pe people know. We were a Mormon community, very church-centered, very community-centered. All the young girls, myself included, were part of the young women's group, and all the boys were members of the local Boy Scout troop, which doubled as a church group in our area. We had 4th of July parties at the local ballpark and swam in the nearby reservoir. It was a good, quiet community. My house, a 92-year-old farmhouse built by my great-great-grandfather, was situated on a small hill surrounded by a wide grass field on one side and a snaking dirt road on the other. Across the road was a creek bottoms. Southern Idaho is categorized in a desert climate, so not much grows outside of the irrigated fields besides sagebrush and burrs. The creek bottoms were the exception. The creek fed the growth of a thick tangle of pussy willow bushes. In the late fall, we used to go down to the bomb and pick the white cotton, p cottony pussy willow seeds to decorate the fences of our driveway. Being so isolated, it wasn't uncommon for animals to uh, come down from the mountains. We had a female moose who brought her calf and lived in our orchard every winter and the occasional lion wasn't unheard of either. The summer when I turned eight, I remember because it was the same year as my baptism, a smaller mountain lion was spotted several times in our area. We weren't worried. The big cats stayed away from the farms and usually moved out on when the area didn't yield enough food. The same summer, my neighbor, Peyton, was working on his Eagle Scout project. He loved National Geographic and thought it would be pretty cool to try putting together a National Geographic submission on our little creek bottoms. The young lion that happened to be in our area at the same time made him especially excited. He decided he wanted to try and get pictures of the lion and emailed the National Geographic team for advice. They recommended setting up an automatic camera that takes shots every couple seconds in an area the lion was known to visit. They also recommended setting some kind of bait so the lion was more likely to come by. No one in the creek liked the idea of live bait or carrion, so we came up with a different kind of bait. We decided to set up an audio recording of a dying rabbit and play it on loop through a set of speakers hidden in the willows. I remember when everyone was down in the bottoms testing the speakers and I heard the noise for the first time. The sound of a dying rabbit is horrible. It's been described as being almost identical to the sound of a screaming child. If you've never heard it yourself, there's plenty of recordings available online. It's worth a listen. The camera was set up, the speakers were set up, everything was perfect. Peyton explained that he would allow the camera and recording to play uninterrupted for a week. Then he would go check on it. This would give time for our scent to fade from the bottoms and encourage the line to come closer. 
At first I was worried about the noise. It was a truly horrible noise, and our house was the closest to the setup point in the bottoms. My father assured me that the noise wouldn't reach as far as our house, and I was relieved when we arrived home that night and he was correct. The bombs were far enough away I couldn't hear anything. I remember Peyton the next day at church. He was fidgety and excited to check on the equipment, but he had to wait a week, which everyone kept reminding him. He couldn't risk going down too early and scaring the lion away for good. That night, I woke up to an awful noise. I sat ramrod straight on my bed with my eyes wide in the dark. His hands clutched so hard, my palms bore the indent of my fingernails for hours after. I knew that noise. It was a recording of the rabbit. It sounded faint and far off, like it really could have been coming from the bottoms, but that was impossible, because the recording had been going on all night the previous day and I hadn't heard a thing. I didn't sleep that night. I was too scared to get out of bed and wake my parents. The recording played over and over again. I had the loop memorized. In the morning, I stumbled to the kitchen for breakfast. My mom and dad were sitting at the kitchen table. They too had dark rings under their eyes. I hadn't been the only one who'd heard it. Mom was convinced that the equipment must have been broken. She wanted to go down into the bottoms to check it out. Dad refused. He was a kind gentleman didn't want to stir up any unnecessary drama. He was sure that there had been a strong wind last night, and the wind was carrying the noise farther than its natural reach. He told us to listen. We did. He was right. We couldn't hear it now. We forgot about it and went on, our, went on about our daily goings. The next night it happened again. I stayed up in bed with my back to the wall. The screaming was even louder than before, but this time something was different. It was lower pitched than I remember. Parts of the loop were slowed down, as if the recording were warped in places. At times the loop did not loop naturally, and instead picked up at a random place in the middle. My mom didn't mention anything at the breakfast table, but both her and my dad seemed tense. The third night I mustered the courage to stand beside my bedroom window and look out into the yard. For a moment I stood, rooted to the spot, my hands shaking no matter how hard I clenched them. The noise sidled in through the cracks in the window. I watched the outline of the trees in the yard, perfectly still. Not even the slightest breeze stirred their branches. My mom announced that she would be going to visit her sisters in town the next day and would probably spend the night there. She invited me to come along, but I was a daddy's girl at heart and chose to stay at, at the farm. I took mom's place beside dad in their bed that night, but even that didn't help. I don't think my dad was asleep either, for he was unnaturally still the whole night. We began to hear the noise during the day, too. I was drawing with chalk on the sidewalk when it happened. My shoulders tensed and the hairs on the back of my neck prickled. There was only one scream, a short high-pitched one, and then the recording fell silent. It happened again several times throughout the day, but never the whole loop, just clips from it. Later that evening, Peyton's dad came up the driveway on his four-wheeler. He said he was looking for their dog, a sweet yellow lab had been missing since that morning. Dad said he was sorry and that we hadn't seen her. I stared at him, silently begging him to mention the recording, but he didn't. He was a quiet man, after all. He didn't want to bring up any unnecessary drama. Mom stayed away the whole week. Dad and I didn't sleep. By Saturday, the screaming could be heard constantly, though it seemed to have deviated from the familiar loop entirely. I didn't recognize any of it. Sometimes the screams were thin and long, other times they were hardly more than growls. Once, while my dad had been heating up meatloaf for lunch, the noise rose to such a rancorous din that he dropped the plate and it shattered. I pressed my hands over my ears where I sat at the table and squeezed my eyes shut, but it didn't help. The noise forced its way in through the cracks of my fingers and pinched my throat and rattled in my ribcage. The din lasted for a whole minute, then fell silent. Dad was shaking. That was the last we heard of the noise that day. Peyton came by Saturday evening to ask permission to cross the road to collect the equipment. He was so excited, I watched him disappear into the creek bottoms with a sense of tired relief. After the equipment was gone, it would all stop. I couldn't wait to get a full night's sleep. Not a minute later, I spotted Peyton coming back up from the creek. I was confused. It had taken us much longer to set up the camera and speakers, so I assumed it would only take just as long to collect them. My breath stilled when Peyton came closer. He didn't look right. His eyes were wide and his face pale. Something wet dribbled from his chin onto his shirt. I later realized it was vomit. My dad caught him before he fell and demanded to know what happened. Peyton couldn't speak. He just cried. We called his dad. I looked after Peyton as both my dad and his dad went into the bottoms. They were gone a long time. When they returned, their faces were grim, and they smelled funny. I noticed red on my dad's hands. I asked what was wrong, but they brushed right past me and immediately called the police. Nobody would tell me what happened. I sat on the couch as a blur of neighbors and police officers swirled around me. At one point, an officer placed something on the kitchen table and left. I looked into the kitchen curiously. It was a camera from the bottoms. I wish I hadn't looked. 
The camera was a little banged up. Tiny scratches and dents covered the plastic casing. When I lifted my hand, stuck to the plastic. Something tacky and odorous covered the screen, but it turned on fine. The first set of photos were normal. Just the pussy willows casting green in the glow of the night setting. As I continued to click through them, they quickly became strange. At one point, the camera angle changed, as if the camera had been knocked from its post. Grass now obscured most of the frame. Flecks of red appeared on the lens and remained for the rest of the set. One photo made me pause. There was a figure in this one, or half a figure, as most of the upper torso had it made into the frame. I thought it could be human, but it didn't look like it should be standing upright. Its legs were twisted, like an animal, and it seemed to have diffi be having difficulty supporting itself in an upright position. Besides the legs, a long, thin arm hung. Whatever it was must have been stooped over, for its fingertips hung below its crooked knees. The next set was different, as if the camera had been picked up and was now being held. The first photo was of the bottoms at night. The next startled me. I had to look closely before deciding what it was. A rabbit had been laid in the bushes, but its ears and most of its scalp had been peeled away. The next was of the same rabbit, but a thin, dark hand was holding it up against the sky. Its limp body hung like something from a nightmare. In the following photos, more rabbits joined the one, each with their ears and scalp removed. Then a cat. Then more cats. Then a dog, the yellow lab. Then the lion. The following photo was of seven rabbits, three cats, one dog, and the lion all laid out in a row, facing the same way. Their arms and legs had been arranged as if they were marching, like some parade. All their scalps had been removed, and a tiny white glint of their skulls could be seen. The last photo was overly bright, like the photo had been taken too close with the flash on. Nye dominated the frame, but it was yellowed and crusty, and had a bar pupil like a horse. In the bottom corner, edge of the edge of a mouth could be seen. No lips, just teeth, sharp and little, with wide gaps of red gum between them. I wish I hadn't looked. I heard my dad talking to the police outside. They said the speakers had malfunctioned. The recording had only played the first night. I knew it was coming, but it was still spoop. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I'm spooped. Are you spoop? That was spoop. spoop. It was spoop. You know, that is actually that is actually something I enjoy as a trope in stories, like the whole oh, it's just the 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 camera or whatever, but like no, the 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 audio recording or whatever, and then it's like oh no, but the audio recording isn't working. And hasn't been working since, I don't know, 1867. You know, those famous <laughs> audio recordings from 1867. Um, I love shit like that. Hello? Oh, there it goes. Oh, were you muted? Yeah, yeah, my device failed or something. I don't know. I unmuted it and didn't do anything. Uh, but yeah, Miller, no, if you were muted, then who was phone? <laughs> 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 Wait, who was speaking with your voice and your name and, and your and your phone from inside the house? I don't know. I get the feeling they're right behind you. Oh, that's just my cat. Oh, <laughs> oh the baby. The yeah. baby. All right. I believe it is my turn. Yes, it is. So I am going to do, uh, I haven't read this one in a long time, uh, and I've never read it out loud on the show, but this is a classic creepypasta that I've always personally enjoyed. This is the cask of uh, Amontillado. No, no, no. This is, this is <laughs> actually a creepypasta and not a post story. Oh, Ty says, but Stoker, you're holding your cat. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this one is, uh. This one is called uh, Anansi's Goat Man Story. And it was originally posted on 4chan in 2012. Dear God, that's been a while. Uh, I, I was considering reading this last time, but it was kind of long. But you can do it. It's a little long. I'm, I'm going to try to make it short-ish. But, I mean, it's still shorter than Ben Drowned. Yeah. Which is unfortunate, because Ben Drowned is fun. Um, so, here's... A Nazi scout man story submitted for the approval of the Midnight Society. <clears throat> Here's my story. This uh, this one starts with uh, some 4chan style green text. Be 16. Be black and have family down in Alabama. 
They farm and own a huge amount of land down in Huntsville. Uncle owns a big house and a bunch of trailers they put out in the woods for hunting or camping. Down South Cousins suggests that we go out there to camp. No, I'm a city kid from Chicago, so they tease the fuck out of me. Collect food, kill a pig and some chickens, and bring necessities to camp out for a few days. We get to the camp and it's obvious something is weird. Air has this weird electric smell like right before a storm, like ozone. We think nothing of it and unpack and go down to a little creek to swim for a few hours. All of a sudden some older white guy and a white teenager come out of the bushes. He has a shotgun in the crook of his arm and says hello and asks us what we're doing this far back in the woods. Tell him about my uncle, who he knows, and say we're camping out. He tells us we need to be real careful out here and stick together, there was a big animal in the woods. His son, who is my age, asks if he can stay and hang out with us. He says okay. Alright, I'm going to stop green texting because the story is fairly long and the format is harder to write in. So we end up playing football. Dicking around with me, there's the white kid, Tanner, five of my cousins, and then four of their friends. In total, there were five girls and six boys. We were all about uh, 15 to 17. We ended up just dicking the day away, so we head back to the camp and pulling out some stuff for a campfire, even though the trailers both had kitchenettes. Tanner says that his family's property sits up against my uncle's. He wants to run home and ask his dad if he can come out camping with us. My cousin Rooster says he's going to go with him since it's going to get dark soon. One of the girls also wants to tag along. It's about 7 o'clock and it's starting to get pretty dark. They take flashlights and take the trail toward Tan's property. The rest of us chill. We make s'mores, drink, and kiss on the girls. About 30 or 40 minutes later, there's the smell of ozone again. You could smell it over the smell of the fire we had started. This really nasty, coppery smell, like right after you've had a nosebleed and it stopped. It wasn't exactly like dried blood, but it was that nasty metallic back of your throat smell. We immediately think that it's some kind of electrical malfunction or someone left a hot plate on or some shit. We search the trailers and nothing is on and we can all smell it. All of a sudden we can hear people booking down the path toward us and Rooster, Tan and the girl all come running into the clearing out of breath. And they don't even break stride, they all run into the trailer right by where the fire is. We all get the fuck out of there and into the trailers. They end up calming down, even Rooster is crying his fucking eyes out at this point. All the while, the fire is guttering lower and lower, and so my other cousins say fuck it, and they're about to go outside to get the generator out of a shed between the trailers. Tanner goes, fuck no! Lock the front door! Ain't nobody else going outside! He's been crying too, and his eyes are bloodshot and puffy and his pants are dirty as shit. He goes on to tell us that they went up to his house. His father said sure, he could go out camping, but to make sure they were careful on the way back, and that maybe they should take one of the hunting rifles just in case. Evidently, Tanner had seen something in their yard a few days before. One of their pigs had come up, ripped up and half-eaten. They assumed it was just some big cats or coyotes, even though they don't usually fuck with live animals. He had gone upstairs and packed his stuff and told his dad they would be okay without the rifle because coyotes avoid people. So they started walking back toward where we were camping. So Rooster finally stops crying and shaking. The girl already had, but she was just staring out the window with a dumb look on her face. He says they had gotten halfway into the woods toward the camp when they started to hear shit in the forest. It was almost pitch black by this time, so they weren't sure at first what the fuck it was. The girl says she heard something in bushes right off the trail and they all beamed their flashlights over there and there was someone standing back in the woods in a little hollow. Rooster said they shouted at him and told them that he was scaring the fuck out of them and what a dick he was. He says that's when he realized that the guy was facing away from them. So they kept walking and they start smelling the nasty coppery ozone smell. They say that they took off into the forest on the look off into the forest on the opposite side and it's a dude standing in the forest backward slightly closer to the path. So now they start power walking and Tan keeps going I should have taken the fucking rifle. As they're telling the story the smell is still super strong even inside the cabin. They say that after they started walking faster, a kind of low gibbering had started coming from both sides of the woods. 
And as they started booking it back to the trailer, the girl said she had flashed her flashlight out into the woods to the side of them and had seen something jerking itself through the woods. The gibbering just got louder and louder, and when they could see the light from our campfire, something had come out of the woods about 40 yards behind them onto the track, and they had just flat out ran as hard as they could to the trailer. So, we're out in the fucking woods, and we're assuming at this point it's some rednecks or some shit trying to fuck with us. All of a sudden, my other cousin, Junior, starts going on about how he went to school with a native kid that was telling him about the Goat Man or some shit. We probably tell him to shut the fuck up, because we don't need any spooky talk right now. But he just keeps going on and on about how it's the fucking goat man, and how we're in his woods, and blah blah blah. Now, at the time, I had never heard of this goat man or any of that, but then a couple of years ago, the year before I graduated from college, I had a menam for a roommate, and I ended up asking him about it. And to sum it up, it's basically a fucking man with the head of a goat, and he can shapeshift and he gets among groups of people to terrorize them. It's also to be supposed to be kind of like the Wendigo, and it's bad mojo to even talk about it, and even worse if you see it. Keep in mind, I didn't know this back when I was 16. So my cousin is going, the goat man's gonna get, going to get in and fucking get us! The girls are all terrified, and my cousins and I are all fucking trying to figure out if it's just some hillbillies or if it's some animal. So all of a sudden, the smell just goes away. Like, to this day, I haven't even experienced anything like it. Like, usually smells fade away or lessen. It was just literally there one second, and then not the next second. So, it's after an hour, making it around 9 or 10. We've stopped shitting bricks long enough to go back outside and stoke the fire again. We figure it was just some assholes trying to fuck with us, so we don't go back home, because we think if we do, they'll chase us through the woods or some crazy shit. Nothing else weird happens that night. And we stay another night, and for the main part of the night, nothing happens. Excuse me. At about one in the morning, we're outside getting drunk and telling ghost stories. As someone is finishing some too spooky story, I don't remember what about, the smell comes back. It's so fucking strong that one of the girls literally starts vomiting. I stand up, and you can actually feel how clammy the air is. I say we should get inside, and this isn't right. We should have just fucking left. We all go back inside, and we're standing around. My cousin just keeps going on about how it's the goat man. And my cousin Rooster tries to shut him the fuck up, and all the while I'm just feeling that something is wrong, and I can't figure out what the fuck it is. We end up sitting in there for a while. The smell is just as strong and we're terrified and all huddled in this camper. We end up cooking brats for everybody because nobody wants to go outside. It's one of those packs with four brats. We have a total of three packs. I grill them up on the stove and give everybody a hot dog. I get mine. After a while, one of my cousins gets up and goes over to the pot to get another one. He starts grumbling about how I get two brats and everybody else only got one. And I look at him like he's fucking stupid. I tell him that everybody only got one because there were only 12 brats. If he wants more, he should open up a new pack and cook some more. That's when the girl that had been out with Rooster and Tan just starts screaming, Oh Jesus, oh Lord, get it out! She's crying and shivering, and then it dawns on the cousin standing up what the fuck is wrong. Me and him both glance around the room, and then I feel my heart fucking sink. I run the fuck out of the cabin, and the girl runs with us. The trailer door is banging against the side of the trailer as everybody books out of the cabin. One of my cousin's friends asks us what the fuck was wrong. I start counting us. There's only eleven now. I shit you not, my cousin verified. There had been twelve people in the cabin. But being that everybody didn't really know each other well, nobody had really noticed the whole fucking time that there was an extra person. And then I realized earlier that I had kind of noticed something was off. You know how when you're just dicking around and having a good time that you don't sweat the smallest shit and you don't always keep track of certain stuff? I'm dead sure that someone else had been in the trailer with us and that they had been there for at least a fucking day eating with us. What makes it worse is, I could figure out, couldn't figure out which one, because I don't think anyone really ever, ever I could figure out which one, 
because I don't think anyone ever actually interacted with the other person slash the goat man. The girl kept praying to Jesus, and we're all sitting outside. Eventually, we get big-ass sticks and go back in the cabin, but there's nobody in there. We count again, and there's still 11 people. We go back into the trailer and lock the door. We explain what the fuck happened, and the girl says that she realized too, and that was that when he was about to say something, the person sitting next to her grabbed her leg hard and leaned over toward her and said something she couldn't understand. So, we're pretty much scared as fuck as we huddle together, and I fall asleep. When I wake up, the sun is just coming up, and half the people are asleep, and the other half are packing our shit up. We all want to walk back home, but like, four people want to stay until the sun is all the way up. And some people think that we're just fucking around and still want to stay at the trailers. I just want to get the fuck out of the woods. The girl's name was Kira, the one the goat man had touched. Anyway, I asked her if she really thinks it was something bad, and she says she just wants to go home and doesn't want to be out in the woods alone for another night. So, we decide to split up. The four that want to go can go, but I have to stay because I have the keys to the cabin and it's my uncle's and I have to lock up. I'm super pissed at this point because I feel like people aren't taking this shit seriously, and I definitely didn't want to be out in the woods for another night. I spent the rest of the day trying to convince the rest of the people, now four girls and four guys, to get the fuck out of Dodge. Tanner leaves with them to go get a rifle and says he's going to be back. So there are just seven of us left by 4 p.m. At around 5 p.m. he hasn't made it back yet, and we're getting extremely fucking antsy, and the only reason I stopped begging them to go back was because he went to get a gun. It's about 5.30 p.m. or so when the one cousin that did stay says that the girl Kira is outside. We all look outside and sure enough she's standing by the fire pit with her back to the cabin. Now I'm thinking to myself, if she was so fucking scared, why the hell would she come back? And then I get this nasty feeling in my gut. Keep in mind, the whole time the coppery smell has been gone, now I realize I can smell just a twinge of it. I say this to the rest of them and everybody, and these are the people that wanted to stay in the fucking woods after we had the goddamn goat man in our midst, is laughing at me and asking if I set this up to scare them. I'm looking at them like, I'm not fucking bullshitting you at all right now. I ask them why the fuck would I play like that? So one of the girls goes outside to get Kira. She gets halfway to her and stops cold. Kira starts heaving. I don't know how the fuck to describe it. Sort of like if someone with their back turned was laughing without actually making any sound. It was this fact that made me realize there was not a fucking sound in the whole woods. It was dead. Silent. This was like later in September, so it was still fairly hot at the time, but it was super chilly some days too. And you could usually hear big-ass geese honking or some kind of birds or squirrels chit-chatting. So I step out the door and tell her to come back in the fucking trailer right goddamn now. She backs up into the trailer and we lock the fucking door. We pull down all the shades except one and put a guy there in a chair to watch her. She stands there for another 20 minutes or so. The guy turns to say that she's still there and there's a huge fucking bang on the door. We all jump the fuck up and scramble around the living room of the trailer. The banging is super fucking loud. So now my cousin is holding one of the girls and the other two are kind of giggling with nervous laughter and me and the other two guys are shitting bricks. Then we hear Tan. He's screaming. Let me the fuck in! Stop fucking playing! So we go over to the door and open it, and he stumbles in with a rifle. There's nobody else outside. Evidently, he had walked up to the campsite. Nothing weird happened in the forest, but he had seen a girl. Mind you, he said it was not Kira standing there. When he had gotten to the edge of the clearing, she had turned toward him with the slack-jawed look and just stared him down, slowly tracking him as he walked around the outside of the clearing towards the camp. He said it wasn't till he was almost halfway to the trailer he had realized that she was getting closer to him. She had started off by the fire, and without him even seeing her move, she had been turning, inching closer. 
He said he just ran the rest of the way back to the cabin, thinking it would open, and when he got to the door and it was locked, he turned and it was about half the distance to the door. He looks around the room and then gets super pale. He pulls me to the side and whispers in my ear, You know there are only seven of us in here, right? I get that feeling where your stomach drops to your nuts. It had been back inside the trailer while we were sorting out who was going where, and then when we all went outside to talk earlier in the day, it had just slipped right back in. We looked out the window and there was nobody out there. So we recount everyone, and then basically I go over, go over and ask everyone how many people were here earlier. And everybody says eight. Well, how many are here now? They all do the count and then realize there are only seven people in the cabin. So Tan had brought back a couple of boxes of ammo in his rifle, and he had told his dad that there was some kind of animal in the forest because he didn't think his dad would believe him if he said it was Goat Man. He says that his cousin is supposed to be coming down in a few hours, and that in the morning we can all go back to his place and his cousin will drive us home. Now I'm really fucking terrified, but I at least feel better because we can be American and shoot the fuck out of whatever it is if it comes back. But then my cousin gets into this huge argument with one of the girls because she thinks that I'm trying to be funny and prank them and that she's getting really scared and that I'm not funny. He keeps telling her that I'm not that kind of person and she says, well how do we know the girl wasn't just Tanner in a wig? Or if it's really the Goat Man, how do we know that this is the real Tanner and that Goat Man just didn't kill Tanner in the woods and take his gun? So, we fucking get into a huge argument about this, where me and Tan are like, we could seriously be in danger because at the very least someone has been sneaking themselves into our fucking trailer without us knowing and mingling with us, and at worst, something bad is in the forest fucking with us. One of the girls is crying and saying she wants to go right now, and we're trying to tell her we shouldn't because none of us are walking through the woods in the middle of the night. At this point, the sun is starting to go down and it's getting a little cloudy out. We eat something and turn on the radio for a while, but we can't really get a station out there with anything decent, so we turn it off at about the time that Tan's cousin shows up. He was like 19, I think. At this point, the sun is just barely over the horizon, and he has one of those heavy-duty lantern flashlights and another rifle. He walks up to the, count to the trailer, and we whisper to Tan, asking if he's sure that's his cousin, and he says yes. The guy looks behind him and all around the camp, then walks in. He kind of glances at all of us and looks a little confused. He says, Where's your other little buddy at? I figured she would meet me up at the cabin. Is she a little slow or something? He also asked whether we had been cooking blood in the cabin because it smelled like blood and hot pans all the way up the trail. We're all like, fucking nope. But we ask him what the fuck he's talking about with the girl he saw. He had come down the same trail Tan had been using, and he had come up on one of you guys' buddies standing in the middle of the trail, looking at him slack-jawed. He had asked her a bunch of questions, but all she did was keep looking at him. Then she smiled at him, and he said he kept walking. She couldn't seem to keep up with him and kept lagging a little behind him. He said he asked her if she was hurt or something and if she needed any help, but she had just continued to stare. Eventually, he had been walking and turning around a bend in the trail, but when he turned around and went back to see if she was okay, the trail was empty. He'd assumed she had taken some shortcut through the woods to our trailer. We tell him the whole story of what's been going on. I half expected him to say we were full of shit, but he just listened and then sat down on the couches in the living room. Tanner's cousin gets back to the girl. He says when she'd kept trying to lag behind him, it had kind of weirded him the fuck out. So he tried to keep her in front of him, but no matter how slow he walked, she was always lagging a little behind. And that he had smelled this nasty smell, and it got stronger as he got to the camp. Eventually it got really strong. She had said something really low that he didn't catch, and when he had turned around she had been right the fuck up on him, and he stepped back from her. It was at this point she, he asked her if she was okay, and if she wasn't, that he would carry her back the rest of the way, and she just kept staring. He said he reached out for her, as in to grab her on the shoulder, but he must have misjudged the distance, because she was off to the side of where he had tried to put his hand, like she had moved while he was looking dead at her. So, at this point we know this shit's real, unless Tan is playing a joke, which we can tell he's not because he's almost pissing his pants. 
So they load up their rifles, we eat some more, and we just kind of sit around until about 11. To this fucking day, every time I think about this, I really pray to God that it's some huge prank that my cousins played on me and just never revealed so I would shit for the rest of my life. At round 11, the stink of copper turns into an actual nasty, gross, blood-like smell, like cooking blood and singed hair. Tan and his cousin Reese get the fuck up instantly and grab the rifles. There's like a half knocking, half clawing at the door, and I shit you not, there's this voice. And it sounds like when you see those YouTube cats and dogs whose owners teach them how to talk, it says in this halting, weirdly toned voice, made my fucking nuts creep up against my body and one of the girls just starts crying and calling on Jesus. It was so fucking obviously not a person talking. It didn't have the right cadence and that's some shit that I never realized until that moment. But all people have a certain cadence when they talk, no matter what language. All people have a certain kind of rhythm to talking. This shit didn't have any kind of cadence or rhythm. One of those YouTube cats, that's what the fuck it sounded like outside the door. So now I'm in full-on terror mode. We keep yelling outside, who is it, stop fucking around, man. And it keeps it just keeps saying, in, or let me the fuck in, for almost 15 minutes. It sounded like this, almost. She'll provide the YouTube link. It sounded like this almost, just not funny. Sorry for being on a tangent, but if you can't, you can't imagine how this shit sounded, then you can't imagine how fucked up the whole situation was. So then the smell goes away for a while, and for the next hour or so you can hear someone basically creeping around in the woods and shit. Every couple minutes it'll come back into the door and say something. Finally, when the smell fades away, it's around 2 in the morning right now. Reese says, man, fuck this, and opens the door and walks outside with his rifle. He fires a shot into the air and then says something to the effect of, in the name of Jesus Christ, go away. He fires two more times, and then from the woods, right up against the river across from the trailer, it sounds like something is slowly gibbering and hooting. Then it starts screaming, and it sounds almost like a woman and a cat in a bag screaming together. Like, I have seriously have never heard any shit like that, and you can hear the brush over that way start to shake. Reese fires over into the tree line and then starts backing into the house. We lock the door and we can still hear this shit keening and screaming. Reese says something had come out of the bushes, super low to the crown, ground and crawling towards the cabin. He had shot at it. Pretty much that was how the rest of the night went. It was literally screaming constantly for the next two hours, and we could hear shit moving out into the tree line, but it never came back up to the cabin until everyone had finally fallen asleep. Tan had been sitting in the chair watching the door with his rifle. Nobody else heard or saw this, and he told me two days later after the whole thing was over. He said he had been nodding off after the screaming and noises finally stopped, and he had been almost asleep when he saw someone come out of the bathroom and then lay down in the middle of the floor and go to sleep. He just assumed it was one of us, and he had nodded off. Then he said he kind of realized something was wrong, and while pretending to be sleeping, he counted us. There were nine people in the cabin. He basically didn't want to try to shoot at the fucking thing in the cabin and have it kill us all then and there, or have Reese wake up and start shooting and then we kill ourselves, so he just stayed awake all night, pretending to be asleep. He said sometimes it would stand up and kind of do this weird jittery thing, or heave like it was laughing, but then it would lay back down. The story closes pretty weak because from my perspective nothing happened. We woke up and I noticed that Tan was a little jittery and that he was avoiding looking at all of us, but we ate some breakfast, packed up, and started walking to his house. He stayed last in the cabin and said he'd lock up and bring me my uncle's keys to just start walking and he'd catch up. 
which I didn't really want to fucking do. We got a little bit up the path, and when he came running up, basically we just jogged back to his house. His cousin took us home. There was a window in the bathroom. Tan had gone back to lock up and looked in there. We were too stupid to lock a screenless window. The window was fucking up when he went in there. I'm guessing it had been doing that all along, waiting for us to fall asleep or slip up and then getting in among us. It walked with us all the way back to his house, and then he said it lagged to the back of the group and looked him dead in the eyes before walking into the woods. Oh, my weird voice didn't come through in the microphone. Yeah, it was like... I mean, that's probably just as effective. Yeah, yeah. it kind of was. <laughs> you know, have so many. Go ahead. No, you, Jonas. Uh, what were you about to say? I was just saying. You ever notice how many, how many horror stories are about liminality? Like, like, oh, you didn't notice the thing that you weren't paying attention to out of the corner of your eye while you were distracted, and there were actually like eight little gnomes on the uh, you know on the lawn, and the eighth gnome was the one that's gonna murder you because it's not really a gnome. I mean, yeah, that's I think for most humans that's where the kind of weird stuff happens when you can see it but like you can't pattern match it to anything because it's outside, right, yeah. like your focus I just think it's interesting <laughs> yeah uh, it's uh it's, it's interesting I've always found that story a little spooky I have forgotten how much profanity was in it <laughs> yeah but that was like all over again. every other word <laughs> Oh man! I mean, it gives it a certain verisimilitude. Yeah, it, it does. does. It you. does. <laughs> fuck you, you fucking fuck! Um, it actually reads <laughs> like somebody's explaining this story instead of uh, having written it out as a. It does. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, I love the fact that his cousin goes outside, fires a rifle in the air, and goes, "In the name of Jesus Christ, be gone!" Like, if more exorcisms were done that way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you just need to get Samuel L. Jackson to do your exorcisms then. I would watch the hell out of that movie. The Exorcist <laughs> remake starring Samuel L. Jackson. Please. Get the fuck out of this. Yeah, oh my god, I would watch the hell out of that. Please this happen, Hollywood. <laughs> I'll forgive a remake this once. Or do what they did with Scary Movie and get James Woods back. <laughs> uh, oh, and speaking of James Woods, it's somebody else's turn. It's GC's yeah. turn. I didn't have a very it good is, segue I, for that. <laughs> all right, I've been looking and looking, and I have found one one more I can do. Well, actually, two more actually. But yeah, here we go. So, it's made for the approval. I it's made for the approval of the I give you the hooded man, written by an anonymous author. Hmm. Have you ever been influenced by clothing? I don't mean confidence by looks. Have you ever been given more control than ever by an item or a truth or just a favorite shirt? Have you ever been influenced in the worst way by showing the truth? The following is taken directly from journal entries. The entries were written by a notorious but unknown killer. He is notorious in the means that everything he has seen his work. He is unknown because nobody knows that he has done it. His origin is unusual, no troubles, no evil family. No magic or paranormal forces. His life was chosen by him and him alone. His identity is also unknown. He will be named from here on as the Hooded Man. April 1st, 2004. It's been really cold out here. I don't have anything really to cover myself. I have a t shirt and jeans, so today I decided to get a jacket. I was just in a local store, nothing special. It's a black hoodie with a white lining. I think it looks pretty cool, and when I tried it on, the attendant said it suited me fine. I said, thanks be polite. Come, courtesy, it's so hard to find. So I bought it. I haven't taken it off yet. Not only is it warm, but I can really see myself doing amazing things with it. When I look at the mirror, I smirk, and I feel amazing. I can't really explain it, but I like it. I really like it. I feel the need to put it on my white hood up. Something about the hood has a way of masking a person, even though it shows her face, it hides some somewhere really late tonight. I've been feeling so great all day. Time flew around me. I'll have to explain more tomorrow. April 10th. I had a hell of a week. 
I felt so great. I walked the halls with a big shot. I'm sure I'd look smug. That's why Jack challenged me. You're so angry. Who'll never do who never do ignoring an insult with more insulting than responding with shrewd comments about someone's family? He antagonized me. He asked for it. He threw a hard punch and I stood. It stung harder than before when I actually argued with him. I felt so cold all week. My confidence kept me up. I punched him hard in the stomach and I lifted him up with an underhook. Felt so good. It really did. Baron's calling. April 14th. Jack still isn't in out of the hospital. They say he's in a lot of pain. He's put a lot of blood. His parents told me to over the phone. I reflected on it. I know great it felt when I first connected. And his crack scream sounded. That's good to hear, I said blankly. I don't care about Jack. I smiled at his pain. I kept staring. I kept staring at my mirror. I always wear my favorite hoodie. Not so. How are you? My friends would laugh at what I was saying. They would compare me to Spider-Man's black suit. Spider-Man threw all his powers away. I don't plan on doing anything like my source of confidence. April 22nd. Jack has gone to a better place. Those words rang through my ear. He's dead. He lost too much blood. His father told me today I visited that he was losing blood due to a personal health condition. The way his mother looked at me told me another story. I killed him. I still remember the satisfaction he did him. I never wanted to kill him. I need to think about what I've done, right? That's... that have fixed my feelings. What is there to think about? Regret is a foolish emotion. I don't need regret. April 24th. Dad has been avoiding me lately, and Mom just tells me she loves me. They both want me to no endless guilt. But I won't. Or rather, I can't. I can fake it to the public, but the truth is I'm not sorry. Spider-Man's story starting to make me think more. Why would a cursed or possessed hoodie man in my possession? Everybody knew Jack Leers at me. Even when I would talk to had transferred themselves out of my class or went to a different school. Teachers don't work me much anymore, or get on to me. If I'm breaking any rules. Today I threw a pencil at his history teacher hit him in the shoulder. Just froze for a second to continue what he was doing. Everyone else either hates me and probably wants me dead or they fear me. My brain is the only comfort I have. I can be at peace and let myself go. April 25th. They provoked me. They threatened me. I had no choice. They would have killed me. My hood protected my face. The knife naturally flew from Robin's hand to mine. I didn't mean to. The writing at this point was cut, cut this point. April 30th. Five days. Five days being in interrogators and sleeping in a cell. They said I was only defending myself. I could hear mom and dad talking. Oh my god, they both scared. I was an idiot to think that this jacket of mine was possessing me or changed my personality. Just a really cool jacket. I love how it looks. I felt like such a badass. I don't remember how I put up the hoodie. I just picked it up when Jack was challenging me. I put it up there with all those guys who tried to kill me. I felt no remorse. I felt different. I'm in control. I finally come to realize insanity. I wanted to kill them. All of them. I need only a push. Confidence to fight. Got it. Mom and Dad are tearing me. They're all intimidating me. That's it. Oh, nice. <laughs> See, this is what Rick and I have been trying to tell y'all all along. Clothes are evil. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You just didn't listen. We tried to tell you. <laughs> now it's too late. Oh, the clothes no. are coming from inside the house. <laughs> also, I, like, I love how he said big shot on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Now's your chance to be a big shot. Be a big, be a big, be a big shot. Big shot, big shot, big shot. Big shot. Hyperlink blocked. <laughs> <laughs> Stampin' is a creepy pasta, isn't he? Yeah. And then we figure out the real secret is that uh, Stampin's powers to hoodie. Yeah. <laughs> All right, who's All that? Right. He's creepy pasta. He has a good like backstory. So we've had stories about geese, bears, rabbits, and goats, but we haven't had a story yet tonight about the one animal most associated with Halloween. I am, of course, talking about a reindeer. Of course. <laughs> what else could it be? Yeah. I was going to be like, are you sure you should be reading this and not, you know, Stoker? But, hey, you know, <laughs> go off, I guess. So, better for the approval of the Midnight Society, this is It Wasn't a Reindeer, written by Michael Page on creepypasta.com. <clears throat> Christ, I muttered to myself as the first flakes of snow started to fall. 
They gathered in fuzzy clumps over the windshield before my wipers cleared them away. I'd been waiting for 50, no, 20 minutes now, in my sister's driveway. Had I chosen to wait inside with her, I'd have been dead by now thanks to her two great cats. Cute little devils, but murder to my sinuses. Puffy eyes and a clogged up throat, that's just what I needed. Every Christmas, our family made the annual trip to my grandparents' cabin, back tucked away in the woods of Hope, Alaska, and I'd hoped to beat the heavy snowfall that was forecasted. Since my sister's license was suspended from a DUI, here I was, a hostage to time, with my finger tapping anxiously on the steering wheel. When my mother had asked me to be the one to grab my sister, I had honestly dreaded her from the start. It wasn't that we hated one another, we just weren't as close anymore. After decades of constant arguments and bitter disagreements, we became distant and our relationship fizzled. Yes, we were siblings, but it felt more accurate to call us the residue of what siblings once were. Finally, like the gates of Valhalla, her front door opened and out she came. Her hair was forest green. The last time I'd seen her, it had been white. The time before that, it was violet. Got everything? I asked as she clambered her way into the passenger seat. Mm, she responded as she adjusted her glasses and stuffed a few bags in the back seat. And just like that, we were off. Hope was about a 30 minute drive and it didn't take long for the awkward silence to inflate between us. It didn't help that the radio didn't work in my car, and that the broken auxiliary port made your music sound like it was having a seizure. By the time we reached the turnoff for Hope Highway, the road was turning into a thick white sheet. Thankfully, on Christmas Eve night, the long stretch to Hope's small community was quick and vacant. The, le the cabin was tucked away in a fortress of trees five miles off the main road. As I made the turn, my sister cracked the window, pulled out a blunt, and lit it with her lighter. You want to hit? She, she asked. Snow crunched between us. Not while I'm driving. It's a straight path. We're practically there already. She took a drag and blew out the window. I want to just focus on this, all right? She often pushed up her glasses. If you're that worried, maybe slow down a bit then. There is the jab, a piece of bait to lure me into another fight. But I wasn't going to bite, not this time. She could live with us getting there faster. The drive was almost over, and I'd soon be in a warm living room with my feet up, a spiked eggnog in my hand, and Bobby Helm's jingle bell rock in the air. I get out of here, Uncle Jed spouting off one of his crew jokes. Why does Santa Claus have such a big... Dude! My sister shrieked, jabbing a finger in my side and whipping my mind back to the windshield. The car had just finished winding around the thick trail. The large body of a reindeer stood in our path. Eyes wide open and blank. It didn't move as the high beams found it. Snapped into a panic, I twisted the wheels in a desperate swerve. The car veered greasily to the side in a fine spray of slosh. The reindeer, also known as a caribou... Remained still, even as the bumper soared inches from its nose. We came to a crunching halt off the main path. Jesus, I sighed, blessed with relief. Did we hit it? No, my sister said, leaning out of the window to check while exhaling another plume of smoke. I wound the steering wheel back and pressed on the gas. The wheels strolled in place, kicking up globs of sleet, but not moving an inch. Perfect, I moaned, and unfolded myself from the seat to check it out. The two front tires were caked in black slush, and practically swallowed in a mound of snow. I kicked at it, trying to clear off the icy debris from the treads and beneath the wheel well. When that tired me out, I resorted to scraping it off with my fingers. Screw off, Prancer, I heard my sister call to the dark silhouette of the reindeer, its antlers like gnarled fingers reaching for the treetops. And she made a sort of startled yip, followed by a, what the fuck? I looked up from the scrim of snow. The reindeer? was now standing tall on both of its hind legs. It looked strange, like a silly caricature you'd see in a kid's book. But out there in the silence of the woods, it was a creepy image. The way its vague shape stood on just two legs held an almost human-like balance. For whatever reason, I realized then it didn't have a tail. Its muscular neck craned to the side and let an ululating scream, a miserable squeal of metal grinding against metal. My legs were ice sculptures, cementing me to the spot as the shriek quieted to a succession of wet grunts. The reindeer dropped down to its original posture and stomped heavily. Puffs of white vapor and strings of snot vented from its nostrils. I was no hunter, but it didn't take a lot to tell when a pissed off animal was about to charge. I leaped to the driver's seat, pulled the door open, and slammed it shut, just as the muffled thud of hoods reached me. Antlers scraped the door as its large body practically flew over the patch I had just been standing in fast. Very fast. My sister screamed as the large bulk of its fame wound back around and charged again, this time shattering the headlights to submerging us in darkness. Just go already! My sister hollered in my ear. Try it, goddammit! I hissed. The wheels continued to spin helplessly. We were trapped. The creature charged again, this time nailing the window. 
A cobweb of cracks bloomed near my sister's head. I searched for anything, literally anything, that I could use as a weapon. I was never really a gun enthusiast, but at that moment I'd have shaved my head and joined the secular monks if it meant having a Glock in my hand right then and there. After rounding the car once more, the reindeer finally appeared to lose interest and disappeared amongst the cluster of trees. Granted some time to breathe and think, we phoned our dad and told him about the situation. He was going to come down in his pickup and get us unstuck and out of the mess. I looked over at my sister, who was taking long and steady breaths between her fingers. Are you alright? I asked. What do you think? She grumbled. I told you to slow down. Another jab, and this time I wasn't going to have it. You want to be useful? I yelled. Get out there and push. No, then shut the hell up. I don't need it right now. She said nothing else, and neither did I, returning once again to the pocket of silence that our relationships had come to. The sooner Dad's headlights peaked in the distance, the better. Suddenly, she rolled the window down. What are you doing? I asked. Shh! She pursed her lips. Just listen. Humoring her, I waited, and sure enough, the sound reached me too. The quiet voice of a little girl coming from outside. Somebody, it whimpered. I'm lost. Please help me. I'm lost. My sister unlocked the door and motioned to open it. I grabbed her wrist. What are you doing? She snapped. There's someone out there. Just, just wait a second. It's weird, isn't it? The voice continued to whine, choking between sobs and pleading for someone, anyone, to help her. I didn't like the way it sounded. The same lasting drawl between words, the same weeping sounds, like someone was hitting repeat on a speaker. Something wasn't right, and my instincts were hoisting red flags left and right. Then my sister looked at me, and my expression, her expression warped into shock. She flung back, pinning both shoulders against the interior. Things that sounded like words bubbled up, but didn't quite make it out of her throat. I turned and saw what was looking at me. It had the face of a man, surrounded by the mottled fur of a caribou's body. The skin was a mummified brown color, bound tightly around its long skull like old crinkled leather. Snowflakes landed upon its wide, expressionless eyes and melted into the dark membranes of its pupils. It circled the car, bobbing its antlers and fogging up the windows as it peered inside. My heart shook the walls of my throat. I locked eyes with my sister, unable to say anything beyond the sheer disbelief. I should have grabbed my phone, snapped a photo, recorded a video, anything, but my thoughts were jangled. It then let out that same horrible scream, but I didn't see its tight contorted lips open. The sound was coming from its neck. Small fleshy orifices flapping open like mouths were converting the high-pitched shrill into the mimic cry of a little girl. Help me. I'm lost. Help me. Headlights glazed the area. My father's pickup came into view, paving its way down the path. The reindeer, or whatever the fuck it was, ran off, vanishing once again into the snow-covered thicket. Nobody believed us. Why should they? If anybody had told me that story, I would have assumed they'd hopped up, been hopped up on some crazy psychedelic. But the reality of what I saw was cold, and it's something I still to this day can't fully swallow. Instead of sleeping that night, my sister and I did some research that led us to the myth of skinwalkers. Beings of some sort, capable of mimicking voices and disguising themselves as animals, to lure people to the woods. After reading other accounts, there wasn't a doubt in my mind that's what we'd witnessed out there. Every so often that night, I'd stare out the window and eye of the yard, wondering if I'd see that leathery face watching from the tree line. Neither I nor my sister ever made that trip again, much to the frustration of my family. But there was a silver lining. She and I have never been closer. That's it. Man, people aren't kidding. Deltarune Snowgrave Groot gets really weird. <laughs> you have somebody say big shot once, and then everything's about Deltarune. <laughs> Listen, Miller, everything is always about Deltarune, okay? Right, the Three no, Musketeers, right. Deltarune. Moby Dick, Deltarune. It's always been Deltarune. It's always been Wackersham. It's always been Wankersham, by which we mean Deltarune. Yeah. So. Now it's Miller's turn. Oh, it's it's turn. Miller time! It's Miller time. Alright. What we got? We got... Right, I'm not leaning... I'm not gonna read my long one, because that's like 30 minutes that would take us to the end. Mm. Yeah, mine was also longer than I anticipated. So I'm going to go with another short one. This is Autopilot. 
by AL365, and I would like to present it to the Midnight Society for approval. Hold on. Pretty sure we did read that one last time. Did we? Almost positive. Uh, okay. Now, you can read well, it again if you want, but... It, yeah, it's like a thousand words. It'll take us like ten minutes. Okay. Autopilot by L365. Gavin thoughtlessly picked on the bandages around his right arm. I've done this job for so many years, but I never experienced something like this. He used his left hand to brush the light brown hair out of his face. I'm sorry if I rambled random stuff. I just can't get a face out of my head. Whenever I close my eyes or whenever I lie down to sleep, I only see her. Staring at me with this anger. This strange woman. I mean, I know she's dead, but why do I need to keep seeing her face? It's just that she's haunting me. Gavin took a deep breath. I've, I've been training and tutoring since I was 16. In, in the evenings, I taught English and biology, and on the weekend, I taught rugby. Both of it was in this poor neighborhood. The area had quite a bad reputation with drugs and gangs, and I heard a lot about abductions and murders and carjacking there. He forced a smile. I'm quite big, I know. But still, I never felt comfortable there. If anything, I thought that my size made me even more obvious. More of a target. I just knew I was out of place. After my last student, I usually basically ran into my car. And the moment I got inside, I locked the doors and drove off as quickly as I could. Gavin shook his head. I did that so many times. At some point, it wasn't even the fear anymore. It was just nearly automatic. I ran out of the house, unlocked the car, jumped in. That wasn't something I thought about. But that evening, I got out later than usual. My student had a test and wanted me to stay longer. As a private teacher, that's not really a request. It's more of an order. If you don't comply, they will quickly find someone else. So I stayed longer until nearly 11 p.m. And right away, when I ran to my car, something fell off. Gavin scratched his arms. It was as if the street was different from what I remembered. The car itself seemed different, maybe more dirty than usual. I literally ran inside, threw my back into the bag into the back, and unlocked the door. And only then I noticed the woman sitting in the passenger seat with a crazy look in her eyes. She had something in her hand. It really looked like a weapon, maybe a bomb or something. And she wasn't shouting at me in this angry language. It sounded like Arabic or something. I was terrified. I just didn't know what to do, and so I started the engine and drove off. I didn't even think about how small she was. She seemed so angry, and I didn't dare to question her. She kept gesturing towards the side of the street, and whenever she did, I looked for the next street and took a turn. But this woman was crazy. I mean, I don't know what she wanted, no matter how much I complied with her orders. She kept getting more and more aggravated, and then she even started hitting me. She hit first my arms, straight with her fingernails into my flesh. Push her back, but I was still driving and couldn't keep her to the side. So that somehow made her even madder. And she hit me only harder and was trying to scratch and hit my face. Gavin rubbed his knuckles. I don't know what came over me. It was more like instinct, like, you know, self defense. I just I hit her straight in the face. I didn't even think about it. I just hit her and I moved the car to the right of the road to hold her back. But she got only more furious and she kept shouting something about Allah and she kept lashing out at me. This is as if she's trying to stab my eyes. And so I said, hit her again, two, three, four more times until she stopped fighting back. And only then, when I saw her lying there with her head against the window, while I was fumbling for my mobile phone to call the police, I looked in the back mirror and saw two children. They were just sitting there, frozen in place, staring at me. They didn't say a word. Then I looked around. For the first time, I really looked around, and only then, I realized that it was the same model, even the same color, but there were stickers on the window. And a small dance in Elvis on the dashboard, and then the stereo didn't look like mine. It looked like mine. It wasn't my car. I really didn't want to kill her. It's just my brain running on autopilot. Okay, that was different from the other autopilot story that I... Well, that was fucked up. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah. Janice, you're still muted. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm never... Hey, has, uh, she's saying, get out of my car, and then says, oh no, I thought I was joking! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, don't, uh... 
Don't don't be in bad neighborhoods. Is oh. that the moral of the story? Gentrification I, I don't know. I... is good. That's the moral. <laughs> It seems like the very first mistake that was made. <laughs> there were many more mistakes that led to this event, but that seems like the first step. Anyway. Okay, I'm done nibbling. Okay. I pass the candle to you, Rick. Okay. Here we have for the approval of the Midnight Society Game of the Shadow Man. By Robert D. Alsbury. The Game of the Shadow Man is one of the earliest forms of demonic summoning rituals known in urban legend, dating as, back, dating as far back as 1200 AD. The ritual has gone under many other titles, the most popular being the Boogeyman Ritual, Satan's Shadow, or simply the Dark Summoning. Many forms of the summoning ritual have come and passed, most resulted in more failures and results, while others simply pass into obscurity. This version, however, is one of the remaining few that yields results. This tutorial will act as your personal guide on how to perform the Game of the Shadow Man. Before enacting the ritual, it is best noted by past reports that the summoner, you, you the reader in this case, must be first informed on what the Shadow Man is as to better understand what you are dealing with. The title Shadow Man is simply a description of what the being is, a tall shadowy humanoid figure. The true name of this creature is unknown, though through a conversation with the being it tends to give a variety of names it refers to itself as. The most prominent name it calls itself by is simply Shadow. The being is a tall, lanky figure appearing, appearing masculine in nature. Its skin, a pale gray, is referred to as rotting while still alive in appearance, and its hair is a thick, ebony black mess. It's always described as wearing a gray or black cloak that covers up everything but its head and hands. However, its hair is always co always covers its eyes as well, making it impossible to see if the figure even has eyes. Furthermore, the nose is described as abnormally sharp, and the mouth is a wide, sharp-toothed smile with lips described as charred skin. The hand of hands of the figure are tipped with a strange black, ashy substance from the foremost bend of the finger to its tip, and is sharpened to a pointed end. Now that the being has been identified, the ritualistic process can begin. There are three steps to the process. The preparation, the execution, and the resolution. First, the preparation. Before the actual ritual can take place, certain forms of preparation must occur. First, acquire access to a decently sized room that, when closed off, will be completely dark. No light must be able to get into the room during the entirety of the ritual, else it will yield no results. Due to this, it is preferred to act during the darkest, hour that are not darkest hours of the night for the best results. This is to give Shadow a place to access during the ritual. Second, grab a pencil and a piece of paper. Not a mechanical pencil, but a genuine number two wooden pencil. Take them both and draw out your, self, your best self-portrait. It seems that realism and details do not matter to the execution as even a simple stick figure yield the same results. After you finish the picture, no matter how good or bad it is, scratch out the eyes with the same pencil. Make it as thick and dark as possible make sure the eyes are completely blotted out and cannot be seen. This is to allow Shadow to have a form, as most claimers detail it as a very similar in appearance to themselves. Added with this, find any piece of clothing that you have worn for at least a month or so. This is to add a layer to the formation of a shadow, and sadly you will be losing this article of clothing in the process. If it's something that comes in pairs, use both. Third and finally, acquire 12 identical candles. This will be both your portal and defense against shadow, and further details about how this will be used are explained later. Following must also be obtained and will be used during the execution process. A candle lighter, a sharp object, preferably a knife, a pair of gloves and socks to wear, black ink. Printer or pen ink is fine, though a decent amount is needed. Now that you have obtained all necessary items, it is time to begin the ritual. Start by going into the selected room and measuring out a space wide enough to perform with. The best way to test is to stick your arms out to your side and spin in a circle. If you hit nothing or nothing gets in the way, you have enough room. It is okay before you begin to have a light in the room to see what you are doing. Begin placing your candles in the circle of space you measured out, each spread, spread out equally apart, and once they have been set, light them all up. Now, close off any light to the room. Make the room entirely sectioned off to just itself with no outside connection. Go to your circle of candles and, using the ink, put out the fire on every other candle. For better reference, imagine the candles like a clock, and put out the ones placed at the 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and 11 spots. 
This is the beginning of the ritualistic process, and as said in reports, this is the portal for a shadow to enter through. If at any moment you wish to back out, simply light up one of the dead candles. However, whatever you do, do not have more candles out than on. These candles are your one safety net, and if you make a mistake, it will not end well. Continuing forward, make sure you have your gloves and socks both on as an added layer of protection. Even with a candle circle, it is very important you have a layer of clothing as well. Take the pre-selected article of clothing you wish to use, set it in the middle of the circle, taking heed not to dis distort or destroy the circle, and stain it with the remainder of your ink. Following that, take up your sharp object and cut a diagonal line from the top to the bottom. Once you have done that, slip in the drawing you had made earlier into the clothing. If it is too small to fit inside, simply lay the drawing on top. Now burn it. Take the lighter and burn the drawing. You won't need your sharp object for any other reason afterwards, and as said before, your lighter can be used if you wish to back out during the ritual. However, if you do back out, never attempt the ritual again. Now the next stage is the one that requires the most direct influence. While the picture is burning, stand back and begin to think of one particular thing, hate. Think of things you despise, things you find horrid and disgusting, things you could harm or kill over. Focus on these thoughts, and all the while, say the word shadow. It's not so much a chant, but you will need to repeat that word over and over again. Slowly, the room around you will shift. It will turn from black and white to crimson and magenta. The air will seem ashy and stale, hard to breathe properly. And from the center of your candle circle, a figure will begin to rise. That is shadow. You will know when it has fully entered the room when, when the room suddenly goes quiet. Even if it was already silent to begin with, it will oddly become even more so. Focus your attention now on shadow. This is where the final stage comes into play. You have brought it into your realm to make a deal with it. So long as you are aware of everything you and it both say, you can converse as you please. There is no penalty in conversation, and you can talk for however long you would like. But the ultimate deciding factor is the deal it provides. You can ask shadow for anything you desire. Fame, fortune, even murder. You can be as simple or as descriptive as possible. However, you must be aware of what is said for both sides of the bet. Make sure anything you bet for and ha make sure anything you bet for and have to pay for is not a major harm to you. Following your request, Shadow will raise its hand to you to shake in confirmation of its deal. So long as you have your gloves, do not worry and take its hand. Before you even realize it, Shadow will have disappeared. The ritual will have been completed, and while it may not come immediately, your reward will be eventually provided. But there is one more thing you must take care of: the gloves. Immediately strip them off and throw them into the circle. Set fire to them, light all the candles on fire, do anything you can to discard of your evidence. Shadow knows of what you've done, but so long as you have destroyed the evidence, it cannot track you. From this point, you have successfully won the game of Shadow Man. You are free to live your life as you please without fear of consequence. What you wish for will come to you naturally. If it was money, you will get bonuses and raises at your job unexpectedly. If it was fame, word of you will get around very quickly and people will take a liking towards you overall. That being said, a few individuals may still be questioning something in the pro this process. What would happen if you were to fail? If you retried the ritual after a previous attempt, failed a step in the execution, or did not get rid of the evidence, what would have happened? The te details of failure are blurry, mainly because not many people who failed are alive to tell the tale. However, there have been a few select reports that detail what might just happen. It is said that when someone fails, the consequences are not immediately noticeable. It may start off as a voice or a visual problem, but soon you will start to notice strange changes in your life, changes that will affect your mind. Most reports show once healthy people developing symptoms of schizophrenia and PTSD after failure, but the worst part is not during the waking hours. This was a, only one report, but it is said that dreams are something like a trip into hell and you can feel and hear it all. No further reports are known of those who have failed. All people who have failed were claimed dead no longer than a week after attempting the ritual. You know, I'm Just glad. Don't fail, forehead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad this one took the time to tell you uh, why you would want to do it because I remember there was this whole genre of creepy pasta for a while that was like, "This is how you stomach the stab you ghost," and never bothered to tell you why you would actually want to summon the stab. Uh, that, that's, you ghost. that's my problem with the uh, whole Bloody Mary thing. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, like, what do you get for calling Bloody Mary? You don't Does get she anything. bring you a Bloody Mary? Because I could, I could understand that at least. But God. what if there were like Taj BC? Can we do practice runs? It does not specify, but I assume that you might be able to. <laughs> I mean, you can get up to the point. What did it say? There was like a, a point of no return, right? Where you can cancel it and you're yeah. fine. But it also you said you need to be in a completely dark area, so I'm assuming you might be able to practice in a light area and nothing would happen. But <laughs> mm. if there were like demons you could summon where they don't do anything bad, they just give you a wedgie or something, and they're like, ha ha, mm. sucker! And then you just, you know. Just, just make sure to board. burn everything after you do it. <laughs> yeah. God, every single demon I summon just wants to, like, have sex with me or kill somebody or grant a wish. I just want to play some video games with someone. Come on. <laughs> hey, I'm Grub, and I'm Satan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah where, where are these sex demons again? <laughs> <laughs> go look up Tabulae. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, okay. It's Doker's turn. It's oh, shoot. Doker's it's Doker's turn. It's indeed Stoker's turn. Doker's turn. Oh, dear. What is Stoker going to read? Um, <laughs> Does Satan smash? Man, that could be two different things. <laughs> <laughs> I had something set aside. What was it? Uh... Oh, dang, I had it in the tab somewhere. Oh, that's way too long. <clears throat> you know what? Uh, let's go for, like, another, like, super classic one. Does that sound good to everyone? Sure. No. <laughs> Jonas, why you kick my dog? He's supposed to be, why don't you kick my cat? Yeah, well, don't do that either. Don't <laughs> kick things. Uh, Radar Head says Satan means Jigglypuff. I believe that. <laughs> Satan means Jigglypuff. Alright. Satan so means Nora. Confirmed. This looks like it'll be a pretty quick read. It's a classic story that everyone probably knows a little bit too well. But nevertheless, I'm gonna do it. Alright. Submitted for the approval of the Midnight Society, this story is The Monkey's Paw by W. W. Jacobs. <clears throat> Without, the night was cold and wet, but in the small parlor of Laburnum Villa, the blinds were drawn and the fire burned brightly. Father and son were at chess. The former, who possessed ideas about the game involving radical changes, putting his king into such sharp and unnecessary perils that it even provoked comment from the white-haired old lady knitting placidly by the fire. Hark at the wind, said Mr. White, who, having seen a fatal mistake after it was too late, was amiably desirous of preventing his son from seeing it. I'm listening, said the latter grimly surveying the board as he stretched out his hand. Check. I should hardly think he'd come tonight, said his father, with his hand poised over the board. Mate, replied the son. That's the worst of living so far out, bawled Mr. White, with sudden and unlooked-for violence. Of all the beastly, slushy, out-of-the-way places to live in, this is the worst. Pathway's a bog, and the road's a torrent. I don't know what people are thinking about. I suppose, because only two houses on the road are let, they think it doesn't matter. Never mind, dear, said his wife soothingly. Perhaps you'll win the next one. Mr. White looked up sharply, just in time to intercept a knowing glance between mother and son. The words died away on his lips, and he had a guilty grin in his thin gray beard. There he is, said Herbert White, as the gate banged too loudly and heavy footsteps came toward the door. The old man rose with hospitable haste, and opening the door was heard condoling with the new arrival. 
The new arrival also condoled with himself, so that Mrs. White said, Tut, tut, and coughed gently as her husband entered the room, followed by a tall, burly man, beady of eye and rubicund of visage. Sergeant Major Morris, he said, introducing him. The sergeant major shook hands, and taking the proffered seat by the fire, watched contentedly while his host got out whiskey and tumblers and stood a small copper kettle on the fire. At the third glass, his eyes got brighter, and he began to talk, the little family circle regarding with eager interest this visitor from distant parts, as he squared his broad shoulders in the chair and spoke of strange scenes and doughty deeds, of wars and plagues and strange peoples. Twenty-one years of it, said Mr. White, nodding at his wife and son. When he went away, he was a slip of a youth in the warehouse. Now look at him. He don't look to have taken much harm, said Mrs. White, politely. I'd like to get to India myself, said the old man, just to look round a bit, you know. Better where you are, said the sergeant major, shaking his head. He put down the empty glass and, sighing softly, shook it again. I should like to see those old temples and fakirs and jugglers, said the old man. What was that you started telling me the other day about a monkey's paw or something, Morris? Nothing said the soldier hastily. Leastwise, nothing worth hearing. Monkey's paw? said Mrs. White curiously. Well, it's just a bit of what you might call magic, perhaps, said the sergeant major offhandedly. His three listeners leaned forward eagerly. The visitor absentmindedly put his empty glass to his lips and then set it down again. His host filled it for him. To look at it, said the sergeant major, fumbling in his pocket. It's just an ordinary little paw, dried to a mummy. He took something out of his pocket and proffered it. Mrs. White drew back with a grimace, but her son, taking it, examined it curiously. <clears throat> and what is there special about it? inquired Mr. White, as he took it from his son, and having examined it, placed it upon the table. It had a spell put on it by an old fakir, said the sergeant major, a very holy man. He wanted to show that fate ruled people's lives, and that those who interfered with it did so to their sorrow. He put a spell on it so that three separate men could each have three wishes from it. His manner was so impressive that his hearers were conscious that their life light laughter jarred somewhat. "'Well, why don't you have three, sir?' said Herbert White like, cleverly. The soldier regarded him in the way that middle age is wont to regard presumptuous youth. "'I have,' he said quietly, and his blotchy face whitened. "'And did you really have the three wishes granted?' asked Mrs. White. "'I did,' said the sergeant major, and his glass tapped against his strong teeth. And has anybody else wished? inquired the old lady. The first man had his three wishes, yes, was the reply. I don't know what the first two were, but the third was for death. That's how I got the paw. His tones were so grave that a hush fell upon the group. If you've had your three wishes, it's no good to you now then, Morris, said the old man at last. What do you keep it for? The soldier shook his head. Fancy, I suppose, he said slowly. If you could have another three wishes, said the old man, eyeing him keenly, would you have them? I don't know, said the other. I don't know. He took the paw, and dangling it between his front and front finger and thumb, suddenly threw it upon the fire. White, with a slight cry, stooped down and snatched it off. Better let it burn, said the soldier solemnly. If you don't want it, Morris, said the old man, give it to me. I won't, said his friend doggedly. I threw it on the fire. But if you keep it, don't blame me for what happens. Pitch it on the fire again like a sensible man. The other shook his head and examined his new possession closely. How do you do it? he inquired. Hold it up in your right hand and wish aloud, said the sergeant major. But I warn you of the consequences. 
Sounds like the Arabian Nights, said Mrs. White as she rose and began to set the supper. Don't you think you might wish for four pairs of hands for me? Her husband drew the talisman from his pocket, and then all three burst into laughter as the sergeant major, with a look of alarm on his face, caught him by the arm. If you must wish, he said gruffly, wish for something sensible. Mr. White dropped it back into his pocket, and, placing chairs, motioned his friend to the table. In the business of supper, the talisman was partly forgotten, and afterward the three sat listening in an enthralled fashion to a second installment of the soldier's t adventures in India. "'If the tale about the monkey paw is not more truthful than those he has been telling us,' said Herbert, as the door closed behind their guest, just in time for him to catch the last train, "'we shan't make much of it.' "'Did you give it for... <laughs> "'Did you give him anything for it, father?' inquired Mrs. White, regarding her husband closely. "'A trifle,' said he, coloring slightly. "'He didn't want it, but I made him take it, and he pressed me again to throw it away.' "'Likely,' said Herbert, with pretended horror. "'Why, we're going to be rich and famous and happy. "'Wish to be an emperor, father, to begin with. "'Then you can't be henpecked.' He darted round the table, pursued by the maligned Mrs. White, armed with an anti-macassar. Mr. White took the paw from his pocket and eyed it dubiously. "'I don't know what to wish for, and that's a fact,' he said slowly. "'Seems to me I've got all I want.' "'If you only cle cleared the house, you'd be quite happy, wouldn't you?' said Herbert, with his hand on his shoulder. "'Well, wish for two hundred pounds, then. That'll just do it.' His father, smiling shamefacedly at his own credulity, held up the talisman as his son, with a solemn face somewhat marred by a wink at his mother, sat down at the piano and struck a few impressive chords. "'I wish for two hundred pounds,' said the old man distinctly. A fine crash from the piano greeted the words, interrupted by a shuddering cry from the old man. His wife and son ran toward him. It moved, he cried with a glance of disgust at the object as it lay on the floor. As I wished, it twisted in my hands like a snake. Well, I don't see the money, said his son as he picked it up and placed it on the table. And I bet I never shall. It, it must have been your fancy, father, said his wife, regarding him anxiously. He shook his head. Never mind, though. There's no harm done, but it gave me a shock all the same. They sat down by the fire again while the two men finished their pipes. Outside, the wind was higher than ever, and the old man stared, started nervously at the sound of a door banging upstairs. A silence unusual and depressing settled upon all three, which lasted until the old couple rose to retire for the night. "'I expect you'll find the cash tied up in a big bag in the middle of your bed,' said Herbert as he bade them good night. "'And something horrible squatting up on top of the wardrobe watching you as you pocket your ill-gotten gains.' He sat alone in the darkness, gazing at the dying fire and seeing faces in it. The last face was so horrible and so simian that he gazed at it in amazement. It got so vivid that with a little uneasy laugh, he felt on the table for a glass containing a little water to throw over it. His hand grasped the monkey's paw, and with a little shiver, he wiped his hand on his coat and went up to bed. In the brightness of the wintry sun next morning, as it streamed over the breakfast table, Herbert laughed at his fears. There was an air of prosaic wholesomeness about the room, which it had lacked on the previous night, and the dirty, shriveled little paw was pitched on the sideboard with a carelessness which betokened no great belief in its virtues. "'I suppose all old soldiers are the same,' said Mrs. White. "'The idea of our listening to such nonsense! How could wishes be granted in these days? And if they could, how could two hundred pounds hurt you, father?' "'Might drop on his head from the sky,' said the frivolous Herbert. "'Morris said the things happen so naturally,' said his father, "'that you might, if you so wish, to tribute it to coincidence.' "'Well, don't break into the money before I come back,' said Herbert, as he rose from the table. "'I'm afraid it'll turn you into a mean, avaricious man, and we shall have to disown you.' His mother laughed, and following him to the door, watched him down the road, and returning to the breakfast table, was very happy at the expense of her husband's credul credulity. 
all of which did not prevent her from scurrying to the door at the postman's knock, nor prevent her from referring somewhat shortly to retired sergeant majors of bibulous habits when she found the post had brought a tailor's bill. Herbert will have some more of his funny remarks, I expect, when he comes home, she said as they sat to dinner. I dare say, said Mr. White, pouring himself out some beer. But for all that, the thing moved in my hand. That I'll swear to. You thought it did, said the old lady soothingly. I say it did, replied the other. There was no thought about it. I had... What's the matter? His wife made no reply. She was watching the mysterious movements of a man outside, who, peering in an undecided fashion at the house, appeared to be trying to make up his mind to enter. In mental connection with the 200 pounds, she noticed that the stranger was well-dressed and wore a silk hat of glossy newness. Three times he paused at the gate, then walked on again. The fourth time he stood with his hand upon it, and then, with sudden resolution, flung it open and walked up the path. Mrs. White at the same moment placed her hands behind her, and hurriedly unfastening the strings of her apron, put that useful article of apparel beneath the cushion of her chair. She brought the stranger, who seemed ill at ease, into the room. He gazed at her furtively, and listened in a preoccupied fashion as the old lady apologized for the appearance of the room, and her husband's coat, a garment which he usually reserved for the garden. She waited as patiently as her sex would permit for him to broach his business, but he was at first strangely silent. I was asked to call, he said at last, and stooped and picked a piece of cotton from his trousers. I come from Ma and Megan's. The old lady started. Is anything the matter? She asked breathlessly. Has anything happened to Herbert? What is it? What is it? Her husband interposed. There, there, mother, he said hastily. Sit down and don't jump to conclusions. You've not ba brought bad news, I'm sure, sir. And he eyed the other wistfully. I'm sorry, began the visitor. Is he hurt? demanded the mother. The visitor bowed in assent. Badly hurt, he said quietly. But... He is not in any pain. Oh, thank God, said the old woman, clasping her hands. Thank God for that. Thank... She broke off suddenly as the sinister meaning of the assurance dawned upon her, and she saw the awful confirmation of her fears in the other's averted face. She caught her breath, and turning to her slower-witted husband, laid her trembling old hand upon his... There was a long silence. He was caught in the machinery, said the visitor at length in a low voice. Caught in the machinery, repeated Mr. White in a dazed fashion. Yes. He sat staring blankly out at the window, and taking his wife's hand between his own, pressed it as he had been wont to do in their old courting days nearly forty years before. He was the only one left to us, he said, turning gently to the visitor. It is hard. The other coughed and, rising, walked slowly to the window. The firm wished me to convey their sincere sympathy with you in your great loss, he said, without looking round. I beg that you will understand I am only their servant and merely obeying orders. There was no reply. The old woman's face was white her eyes staring and her breath inaudible. On the husband's face was a look such as his friend the sergeant might have carried into his first action. I was to say that Ma and Megan's disclaim all responsibility, continued the other. They admit no liability, no liability at all, but in consideration of your son's services, they wish to present you with a certain sum as, com as compensation. Mr. White dropped his wife's hand and rising to his feet, gazed with a look of horror at his visitor. His dry lips shaped the words, How much? Two hundred pounds, was the answer. Unconscious of his wife's shriek, 
The old man smiled faintly, put out his hands like a sightless man, and dropped a senseless heap to the floor. In the huge new cemetery, some two miles distant, the old people buried their dead and came back to a house steeped in shadow and silence. It was all over so quickly that at first they could hardly realize it, and remained in a state of expectation as though of something else to happen, something else which was to lighten this load, too heavy for old hearts to bear. But the days passed, and expectation gave place to resignation, the hopeless resignation of the old, sometimes miscalled apathy. Sometimes they hardly exchanged a word, for now they had nothing to talk about, and their days were long to weariness. It was about a week after that that the old man, wa waking suddenly in the night, stretched out his hand and found himself alone. The room was in darkness, and the sound of subdued weeping came from the window. He raised himself in bed and listened. Come back, he said tenderly. You will be cold. It is colder for my son, said the old woman, and wept afresh. The sound of her sobs died away on his ears. The bed was warm and his eyes heavy with sleep. He dozed fitfully and then slept until a sudden wild cry from his wife awoke him with a start. The paw! she cried wildly. The monkey's paw! He started up in alarm. Where? Where is it? What's the matter? She came stumbling across the room toward it. I want it, she said quietly. You've not destroyed it? It's in the parlor on the bracket, he replied, marveling. Why? She cried and laughed together, and bending over, kissed his cheek. I only just thought of it, she said hysterically. Why didn't I think of it before? Why didn't you think of it? Think of what? he questioned. The other two wishes, she replied rapidly. We've had only one. Was that not enough? he demanded fiercely. No, she cried triumphantly. We'll have one more. Go down and get it quickly and wish our boy alive again. The man sat up in bed and flung the bedclothes from his quaking limbs. Good God, you are mad, he cried aghast. Get it? She panted. Get it quickly and wish. Oh, my boy, my boy! Her husband struck a match and lit the candle. Get back to bed, he said unsteadily. You don't know what you're saying. We had the first wish granted, said the old woman feverishly. Why not the second? A coincidence, stammered the old man. Go oh, get it and wish, cried the old woman, quivering with excitement. The old man turned and regarded her, and his voice shook. He has been dead ten days, and besides he... I would not tell you else, but I could only recognize him by his clothing. If he was too terrible for you to see then, how now? Bring him back, cried the old woman and dragged him toward the door. Do you think I fear the child I've nursed? He went down in the darkness and felt his way to the parlor and then to the mantelpiece. The talisman was in its place, and a horrible fear that the unspoken wish might bring his mutilated son before him ere he could escape from the room seized upon him, and he caught his breath as he found that he had lost the direction of the door. His brow cold with sweat, he felt his way round the table and groped along the wall until he found himself in the small passage with the unwholesome thing in his hand. Even his wife's face seemed changed as he entered the room. It was white and expectant, and to his fears seemed to have an unnatural look upon it. He was afraid of her. Wish! she cried in a strong voice. It is foolish and wicked, he faltered. Wish! repeated his wife. He raised his hand. I wish my son alive again. The talisman fell to the floor and he regarded it fearfully. Then he sank trembling into a chair as the old woman, with burning eyes, walked to the window and raised the blind. He sat until he was chilled with the cold, glancing occasionally at the figure of the old woman peering through the window. 
the candle end, which had been which had burned below the rim of the china candlestick, was throwing pulsating shadows on the ceiling and walls until, with a flicker larger than the rest, it expired. The old man, with an unspeakable sense of relief at the failure of the talisman, crept back to his bed, and a minute or two afterward the old woman came silently and apathetically beside him. Neither spoke, but both lay silently listening to the ticking of the clock. A stair creaked, and a squeaky mouse scurried noisily through the wall. The darkness was oppressive, and after lying for some time screwing up his courage, the husband took the box of matches and, striking one, went downstairs for a candle. At the foot of the stairs the match went out, and he paused to strike another, and at the same moment a knock, so quiet and stealthy as to be scarcely audible, sounded on the front door. The matches fell from his hand. He stood motionless, his breath suspended until the knock was repeated. Then he turned and fled swiftly back to his room and closed the door behind him. A third knock sounded through the house. What's that? cried the old woman, starting up. A rat, said the old man in shaking tones. A, a rat! It passed me on the stairs. His wife sat up in bed, listening. A loud knock resounded through the house. It's Herbert! she screamed. It's Herbert! She ran to the door, but her husband was before her, and catching her by the arm, held her tightly. "'What are you going to do?' he whispered hoarsely. "'It's my boy! It's Herbert!' she cried, struggling mechanically. "'I forgot it was two miles away! What are you holding me for? Let go! I must open the door!' "'God's sake, don't let it in!' cried the old man, trembling. You're afraid of your own son, she cried, struggling. Let me go. I'm coming, Herbert, I'm coming. There was another knock, and another. The old woman with a sudden wrench broke free and ran from the room. Her husband followed to the landing and called after her appealingly as she hurried downstairs. He heard the chain rattle and the, bo and the bottom bolt drawn slowly and stiffly from the socket. Then the old woman's voice strained and panting. The bolt! she cried loudly. Come down, I can't reach it! But her husband was on his hands and knees, groping wildly on the floor in search of the paw. If he could only find it before the thing outside got in. A perfect fusillade of knocks reverberated through the house, and he heard the scraping of a chair as his wife put it down in the passage against the door. He heard the creaking of the bolt as it came slowly back, and at the same moment he found the monkey's paw and frantically breathed his third and last wish. The knocking ceased suddenly, although the echoes of it were still in the house. He heard the chair drawn back and the door opened. A cold wind rushed up the staircase, and a long loud wail of disappointment and misery from his wife gave him courage to run down to her side and then to the gate beyond. The street lamp flickering opposite shone on a quiet and deserted road. Shh. <laughs> okay, that was a bit different than the a adaptations I've seen. <laughs> yeah, it is a little bit, yeah. I like that. But, I do. I kind of like that it leaves it there. It's just like, what is the trade-off for the last wish? It doesn't matter. <laughs> All that matters is that he solved the now problem. Yeah. Well, I mean, honestly, at this point, the trade-off for the last wish is still the same as the trade-off for the first wish. Their son is gone. The trade-off for the last wish is they just they wake up in the morning and discover everyone else in the world is a mannequin. <laughs> the trade-off for the last <laughs> wish is it's a cookbook. Yes, it is. <laughs> All right. Boxer, by adaptations, do you mean The Simpsons? No, it was one of those uh, horror anthologies. This story has been adapted, referenced, parodied, and re-referenced and re-parodied so many times, I couldn't even begin to. 
uh, to count them all. The first time I ever saw a version of it was actually in Are You Afraid of the Dark when they took the premise, changed the item, and of course, you know, didn't have a horrible mutilation and death because Nickelodeon tends to frown on that sort of thing, and called it the Tale of the Twisted Claw. You know, there's an argument that a whole swath of Twilight Zone episodes were basically this formula. Like, oh, I want something so much! Uh, I would do anything to have this! Oh no! I got exactly what I wanted and it wasn't really what I wanted, and also like, like, I don't have hands anymore, I have hooks. And also, I'm Hitler now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because that did happen in the yeah, Twilight Zone. Sure did. <laughs> All right. Oh no! You began. He made his worst enemy. No. No. I've combined the DNA of all the most evil animals in the world to create the most evil animal of them all. It turns out it's man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> All right. It is after midnight. Do we want to continue on? Does anyone else want to do one? Or are we calling this uh, meeting of the Midnight Society closed? I I kind of like stopping it there because that leaves everybody reading two stories exactly. That's yeah. true. That's true. Even though my first one was like an hour and a half long. <laughs> yeah, only like 40 minutes. <laughs> 35 All right. Minutes. All right, well, I hope you all enjoyed our spooky, spooky stories, and mm -hmm. I hope you'll join us next week for more. We hope you enjoyed the narrative, or rather, the scarative. <laughs> Crypt Keeper. I was yes, waiting for it. <laughs> Okay. As I've said many times before, Jonas apparently thinks the Crypt Keeper is a Pokemon who just always <laughs> says his own name. <laughs> he does. Hey, Jonas. I think Jonas thinks he's the Gamekeeper. There's a, th there's a little tiny difference there. Yes. Tiny <laughs> TC gets it. <laughs> uh, All right. Well, have, been, um, have any of you been watching the um, the Awesome Games Done Rick YouTube channel? I go there once in a while. He's been doing, um, or they've been doing custom thumbnails for all of these particular videos. Are you serious? Like, I gotta check they, that out. They've been kind of funny. <laughs> They're mostly just like PNGs oh. they, they copy pasted, but some of them are kind of silly. Where they're like, hmm, how do I find a picture of this that like relates to this story? <laughs> That's fantastic. I have to check that out. I still can't believe someone's doing that. This one better have like a lot of animals in it, like bears and Oh yeah, we need a yeah. what was it? A bear, goat, uh, bear, a goat, a rabbit, uh, a, a goose, and and a and a raider, and a bat. Uh, Frederick Frederick suggested to me that we should all read scary stories about our personas, but I don't know how many kangaroo horror stories there are out there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm hold on. Let me try raccoon creepy pasta. Green cats creepy pasta is probably not existent. I mean, the thing is, like, at least with bats, I know I got some material. <laughs> at least I can go for cats, but uh, but yeah, green cats, though. No. Oh my god! Well, I'm a like... green cat, a green cat's just like a cat past its expiration date, isn't it? Oh, uh, what was that right, mm. <laughs> uh, It's more like a teenage cat that's been it's living in a tree for too long. The cat that's been living in a tree. It's a cat that's not ripe yet. Yes. Nice. All right. Okay. It's been fun. It's been real. It's been real fun. Enjoy your spooks nights. Can I say it? Can I say the thing? I now declare this session of the Midnight Society officially closed. Oh. Uh, all right. Yeah. So Thank you for coming out. Have a good night. Good night, all everybody. Right. Good night, folks. Good night. I take my black cape and put it on my face, and good night, everybody. <laughs>